deeper the quicksand, or so I have read. My baby fits me like a flesh tuxedo. I love to sink her with my pink torpedo. <laughs> <laughs> that clip has to make a comeback of you singing that totally out of context. <laughs> Yes, please. I, th I think we found, you know, the little preview that goes pre-credits, mate. Yep, <laughs> that's it. That's the one. <laughs> okay. Hello there, cultists. I'm feeling so very weird. That's right. It's a total eclipse of the sun out there, I see. Like me, you couldn't help but notice that strange and interesting plant in the window. You guessed it. In today's episode, we're going to be going all musical as we take a look at Frank Oz's directorial classic, Little Shop of Horrors. And as is always the case, I won't be doing this alone. So before we go downtown, allow me to introduce you to today's guests. First up, he's here more often than not. And who can blame him? He's the Audrey 2 to my Seymour. Just so, so long as he doesn't try to eat me. It's Mike Wilson. How you doing, Mike? Hi, I'm just a mean podcaster from outer space and I'm bad. Well, you know, Earth technically is in outer space. so <laughs> Yeah, that is very, very bad right now. So, yeah, we do seem to keep uh, running into each other on these shows, mate. <laughs> well, given that we are the hosts of the podcast, it's not that surprising, but okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm still, I'm, I'm still going to have to try and get you onto the black hole one, regardless. We'll try, we'll try. We'll see if our schedules align. <laughs> yeah, nice. It's uh, it's only been a few short days since our Flash Gone review, but have you been watching anything good this past week? And I'm assuming the, uh, the clean-up job after talking all things Flash didn't take too long and allowed time for it. <laughs> well, you know what I... Because I tend to tell you what I've been watching. The main thing that I watched was the DC animated film, Justice League War World, earlier today. Um, yeah, that's more or less it, unfortunately, since Flash Gordon, because I've been busy doing other stuff. Nice. Okay, but uh, fear not, dear audience, it's not just Mike and I droning on once more. We do like to give you some variety. You're welcome. So this week, we're, uh, we're also joined by a regular visitor to the Silver Screen podcast. She was last on our Evil Dead review. It's Sandy. How are you doing today, Sandy? I'm doing well, thank you. Very good. Have you had a good week? I've had a, I've had a pretty good week. It's been oppressively hot, but other than mm. that, good. Yeah, I, I know that feeling all too well. Uh, I'm going to throw the same question I posed to Mike over to you. Have you been watching anything good this week? Um, actually, yes, I've been um, catching up. I've been re-watching uh, Foundation uh, because it merits a re-watch before diving into season two. So I've re-watched that and I've just started season two of that. So that's my binge right now. I'm hearing a lot of good things about that. I love it. It's such a unique sci-fi story. Um, it, it really freshens it up when you're, you know, you, we binge so much stuff, we watch so much stuff. It's easy for sci-fi as a genre to get stale, especially space operas. And this is just a very unique take on it. Nice. I'll have to, uh, I'll have to check that out. So yeah, thank you. Uh, but wait, there's more. For this one, we're not just joined by one guest, we're not just joined by two guests. This time there's a proliferation of guests, like a bunch of killer plants that are taking over the show. So please allow me to introduce our third guest on today's episode, and another newcomer to the Cult Classics podcast, it's Alison. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Not a problem. How are you today? Would you, uh, would you like to tell us in the audience a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I'm doing good. It's been a good day. Um, Let's see. So I live in the state of Georgia in the United States near the Atlanta area. I am a licensed professional counselor and I work in the um, insurance industry, like health insurance. But I also do um, therapy on the side. I see clients in private practice and um, big kind of sci fi geek. I love Anything sci-fi, Star Trek, Doctor Who, those are probably my two big favorites. Oh, you're definitely among friends here. 
I was just going to say, you're a sci-fi geek and a therapist. I've got to get your number after this. <laughs> <laughs> well, the same question goes to you, Alison. Have you been watching anything uh, interesting this week? You were telling us earlier about Barbie, but uh, on top of that, anything, mm -hmm. anything else? Yeah, so I actually got um, two free passes through Amazon Prime to see the uh, first two episodes of Good Omens 2. Mm. So I did that on Wednesday with a friend and really good. I actually am liking the second season better than the first season. It's more of a background of their characters and um, how they kind of came to be. And, um, you know, they do a lot of flashbacks of things that um, they did. They've done over their lives and it shows a, it goes into a lot about their relationship as a couple. Um, you see more about that. Um, I've also been binging, but I had to take a break because I was getting kind of annoyed with their, um, talk about, um, the gift or whatever it is, but manifest. I don't know if anybody's watched that. Um, yeah. The callings. They're yeah. like the callings, the callings. So I got a little annoyed with that. So I had to take a break and, um, I'm late to this, but I've been watching American horror story. I'm on the third season, which is the, Yay. I think the freak show one. Um, but I, you know, the I think, fourth season. Oh, okay. It is? Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I like, you may have skipped one, but I'm not sure. No, I liked Asylum. Asylum has been my favorite so far, you know, the whole psychological I, thing. I, it was my favorite until freak show as well, but then I hated the ending because it just went completely batshit out of nowhere. Yes, you're right, because the third season was The Witches, and that one was kind of yeah. like, eh. Um, but yeah, so we'll see how freak show is. And, but yeah, so, um, and I was also going to say, Sandy, I love Foundation and I need to rewatch it in preparation for the second season. And I'm excited what you said about Good Omens, because that montage in the very beginning that shows them throughout history in, in season one was one mm -hmm. of my favorite parts. So it sounds like you're telling me it's a grander m montage of that. Definitely. And I would say that that montage changes too the one that they're doing and they've got some new characters in the second season. Um, you know, it, it definitely goes more in depth, which that sounds I, really fun. Yeah. I thought the first season were fantastic. So to hear someone say that the second season so far is even better. I'm really looking forward to that one now. So uh, as has become the tradition on cult classics, we always ask each new guest this question. So Alison, if you had to choose, what would you consider to be your all-time favorite cult movie? And Mike and I have got quite a lot riding on this right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really like Empire Records. Oh, wow. Okay. Ooh. Oh, Alison. Uh -oh. No, okay. no, no. That's that's fantastic. You, you, Mike and I had a little wager going that uh, we, we've had that many guests now give their favorite, and we're getting to a point where we think the next guest is going to give one that we've already had. And oh, I was, okay. uh, no, I don't, I think she's going to give a new one. And uh, yeah, you've won me that. So thank you for that. Yes. I mean, I think everyone could say, you know, Rocky Horror. That's just. Kind oh, of see, I would have, would have said that. <laughs> yeah, the classic of classic. But I was like, no, I wouldn't say that's my favorite. You know, I mean, I like it. I think the live showings are fun to go to. But, but, you know, my favorite definitely would have to be Empire Records. Um, yeah, I like so cool. the characters in it, the music, nice um, and it's you know, kind of, I mean, that's like my teenage years too. So yeah, it gives you that nostalgia. So. It's awesome Great. that we've had like nine separate answers from all of the people. We yeah, saw right I <laughs> love what, some of the, what are some of the other ones y'all had? We've oh, had uh, Blade Runner, Donnie Darko, uh, oh, The Thing, yeah, Rocky Horror, yeah. Flash Gordon, um, and I Lost Boys. <laughs> Lost Boys. Yeah. Yeah. The Lost Boys is a really good one. I didn't even think about that one as a cult classic. Yeah. Yeah. Just entering into the territory, I think. Yeah. Yeah. We allowed it because it's. Uh, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. So yeah, let's uh, let's get down to taking a look at today's movie. Now, uh, Little Shop of Horrors was based on the Roger Corman movie of the same name, released in 1960, and featured a very young Jack Nicholson in his debut movie role. Despite his relatively small role in the original, Nicholson, obviously much bigger star later on, was later used in promotional materials for the movie. 
later reminisced about the film's tight budget, saying that Corman, a noted cost cutter, wouldn't even pay to make copies of the script. <laughs> now, after its release, the picture became a popular title on late night television. It also inspired a hit uh, off-Broadway show, premiering on May the 6th, 1982. The original production ran for a month until it got picked up by a producer and began an impressive 2,209 performance run over the next five years, making it at the time the highest grossing off-Broadway production ever. Now, David Geffen was one of the original producers of the off-Broadway show, and he began planning to produce a feature film adaptation. Originally, Steven Spielberg was attached to serve as executive producer, with Martin Scorsese attached to direct, which he wanted to shoot in 3D, apparently. But production was stalled when a lawsuit was filed by the original film's screenwriter and actor, Charles B. Griffin. Later on, John Landis was also attached to the project for a time. Now, music producer and Four Seasons member Bob Gaudio adapted and produced the musical's songs for the film. Geffen then offered the film to Frank Oz, who was finishing work on The Muppets Take Manhattan around the same time. Oz initially rejected it, but later had an idea that interested him in the cinematic aspect of the project. He spent a month and a half restructuring the script, which he felt was at that point too stage-bound. Geffen and Ashman liked what he'd written and decided to run with it. Oz was also studying the off-Broadway show and how it was thematically constructed. In order to reconstruct it for a feature film, the $25 million adaptation hit theatres in 86 and eventually grossed $39 million at the box office, which from the viewpoint of the studio was considered an underperformer. However, it became a smash hit upon its home video release in 1987 on home media and over the years, well, we're here for a reason. And for those of you out there interested, Little Shop of Horrors is currently available on streaming services as well as DVD and Blu-ray. So I've got to ask you guys, what were your first experiences with the movie? I was uh, I was kind of at school at the time, so I obviously didn't catch it in cinemas. But when it was released on home media, there were, how can I put this delicately, uh, VHS copies circulating in the playground at the time. And he ended up with with one of those. I think it was a double feature with Robocop on the same tape. I remember liking it, but not loving it. It's only as the years have gone on that I've come to appreciate it, though not necessarily every aspect of it, depending on my mood. So what were your first experiences of it? Um, I think for me, I would see kind of bits and pieces of it in syndication on TV. And then in high school, I actually saw a play put on of it. Um, I think it was like a community production or a high school or something like that. And I remember wasn't a big fan of it. I thought it was a little weird, kind of like Twilight zone in my opinion. Like, what is this going on? Um, I really hadn't come into my love of sci-fi yet, um, that kind of, you know, stuff. But um so it was refreshing watching it again after so many years. I had an, a different love and appreciation for it. Yeah, I remember what, when I kind of dropped this on you, you were like, oh, God, I need to try and find a copy. So, yes. yeah, I think you say it was on Max one night. Yeah, it's on it's on Max um, in the United States. And, yeah, it's probably been at least 25 years since I'd seen it. Um, oh, wow. What about you, Sandy? When uh, What was your first experience with this? I'm still trying to wrap my head around the fact that your playground had a bunch of bootleggers in the <laughs> 80s already. Oh my God, trust me. It was Can like- Can you expand on that a little bit more? It was, oh, I don't, is this not a thing in America? Is it just- I didn't know, yeah, no, not at that not time. Not on the playground. Oh God, yeah. Yeah. it was like, you'll never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. <laughs> Honestly, it was- uh, <laughs> I, I can confirm that we had this in our playground quite often as well. There were copies of like Big Trouble in Little China and stuff that were oh, very gosh, inappropriate. Yeah. It <laughs> wasn't just, I mean, obviously the, the big films at the time that were just released, they were more in demand. But you had people going around with lists saying, you know, what can I get you? Was it other students or was it like? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Or men in trench coats with VHS. <laughs> lined That's up why I was like, time. we got, we got uh, Little Shop of Horrors. We got Rocky Horror for five bucks. Hey, kid. So, hey, kid. Know. Come here. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, we have we have people that do bootleg or they used to, but it was more so you'd buy it 
they wouldn't come up like they wouldn't be out on the um it was way more shady basically yeah way more shady (laughs) in our case it used to be that people would just record them on tv when you had like videotapes so they would wait until it was on one night leave the tape running or whatever record it and then make multiple copies of it and take it to school like hey, this oh, film wow. i mean yeah we did that but we didn't <laughs> think about making an enterprise out of it that's oh, I know. amazing we seriously amazing. Missed yeah we had out. people yeah. at ours that would that they would not only get you a copy of the tape but if you really you know if you wanted to pay a couple of pound extra they would make sure you got a copy uh the cover as well yeah they'd photocopy oh, wow. a kind of cover off the internet or something <laughs> oh no 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 they they uh, from where i can gather they would actually acquire them from local video stores <laughs> oh good lord we never had that <laughs> i'll give you that then fair enough yeah, yeah these pe- now what are these people doing now please tell me they're like probably in jail <laughs> probably no, I don't, no. I think <laughs> they've got a server be. farm they've got a server farm now <laughs> yeah i was like they gotta be geniuses because that's just enterprising Whew. But basically, (laughs) I saw this uh, maybe when I was about 12 or 13 on TV. um, And for me, uh, growing up, Saturday Night Live every Saturday night was like a really big deal with my parents watching it. But even when they were disinterested, by that time, I was obsessed. So anything with Chevy Chase, Steve Martin, uh, yeah, Rick Moranis, uh, John Candy, Eddie Murphy, all of them anything I was obsessed, especially Steve Martin, who actually was the least best part of this film, I think. But um, just saw it way back then. And then there's this huge gap where I probably haven't seen this again, probably 25 years. It's it's probably how long it's been since I've seen it. And I just have a new appreciation for it. I don't know. I mean, it almost looks remastered. I think it held up so well. So I'm Mm. really excited to talk about this. Nice one. And you, Mike? I don't really have a particular connection to this film just because I don't... It was one of the films that, you know, how you know about, like, film's existence and you might have seen it in passing, a bit like Alison was saying on TV or something. Yeah. So I kind of knew of I knew of its existence, but just knew that I wasn't overly fond of the things that I'd seen. And I didn't know anybody that was a fan, so I didn't have any, like, you know, contemporary friends or family or anything that would introduce me to it. Um, and then I was... Uh, it was when I was in my last years of high school, I started dating a what the Americans would call a theater kid, um, a, a girl who was very into kind of, you know, music and stage performances and stuff. And uh, yeah, she made me watch it with her one night and I did not have fun. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I was like, wow, okay, fair enough. This, this now is what this you is. know how all your dates <laughs> feel when you sit them down with Star Trek. <laughs> nah. So, nah. Yeah, a few, uh, a few weeks later... Think. A few weeks later, she was like, um, you know how like in a relationship you don't say anything. So after the it ended, I was like, yeah, good movie, whatever. Then a few weeks later, she was like, oh, let's watch Little Shop of Horrors again. I was like, can we please not? But she put it on and then realized, I think after about 10 or 20 minutes that I was in a major huff with having to sit through this again. It was quite tortuous. And I think she she kindly made a bit of an excuse and was like, I'm turning this off. I can't handle Audrey's voice for 90 minutes. I was like, whatever your excuse you want, just turn it off. <laughs> nice. Well... <laughs> Well, we'll get into the behind the scenes stuff in a short while. But as you guys out there know in the real world, it's a cult classics episode. So we always throw some kind of nonsense in there out of left field. Sometimes it's an interview, sometimes it's a quiz, and occasionally it's something completely tangential to the subject. And, <laughs> well, you lucky people, this time it's two of those things. And no, it's not the interview, I'm afraid. So without further ado, I'm going to throw the mic over to, well, Mike. Who assures me he's got something very special for us. So go for it, man. Yes, I wouldn't say it's not related. Um, what it is, if you uh, are a listener to the Silver Screen podcast, both main and cult, you will know that um, I have a bit of a fondness for musicals. And the last time we reviewed a musical was Chicago, when I brought a game to the proceedings, which I have brought with me again today. So um, I'm going to ask the three of you to compete against each other. Uh, so what I'm going to do, there's a game that I like to call Once More Without Feeling. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's Buffy. Um, yeah. <laughs> I love that. uh, what it is basically, I have 30 examples at most to get to of lyrics from songs from musicals. I'm going to read them out with an attempt to be as little emotion, inflection, or passion that you can possibly get. Um, and I want one of you to use your name as your buzzer, shout out your name if you think you know it, and tell me the name of the musical that it's from, and a bonus point if you can tell me the name of the song as well. 
Um, but, you know, you don't have to worry about that. Mainly I'm looking for the musical. But, again, if you want that bonus point, you can tell me the song title. So, um, yeah, are you all ready? <laughs> oh, my gosh, yes. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll say so. I love this game, so I'm ready into and waiting to host it. You, you well, with us, I, Alison? I, you understand? <laughs> I do understand. I'm. I like musicals, but I'm not well versed in them, so I will do the best I, I can. Well, don't worry about it. Whatever, whatever Mike does a quiz, I'm always in last place, so I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> I'm and I'm already like petrified, and my mind's gone blank. So I, I we will should say, I try to. Uh, <laughs> I try to make the definition of musicals quite broad. So there's everything in here from comedy musicals to Disney. Broadway musicals to fun, <laughs> Disney, exactly. Yay. So, yeah. So okay. without further ado, then, we're ready. Are you ready for number one? And uh, as I say, if you want to interrupt me anytime by shouting your name, that'll serve as your buzzer. You get a point if you get the, uh, the movie and a point for the title of the song. So <clears throat> number one, I should be anywhere but here, private planes on the stage or on TV. But I find myself here at the snot house. Little shoes, little socks. Please kill me. I'm serious. Please kill me. I'm not singing. I'm asking. Are you okay, definitely Mike? Sorry. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, definitely. Is this a question or a cry for help? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was questioning it there towards the end. Darn it, um, I don't. I have this no is, idea. I can it's guess. Allison and I'll guess. Yeah, same. You okay, Alison, I heard you. You first. Okay, I'm going to guess Annie. It is from Annie. Absolutely. Ooh, How did wow. you know that? Yay. <laughs> nice one. Yay. I mean, I, that's one I've actually seen several times. I love Annie. This my one guess, is making the, my sorry, guess the is rounds. My guess is going to be Les Miserables. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm afraid not. <laughs> but there's no airplanes. So, and do you know the song, the name of the song by any chance, sorry, Alison? I'm going to guess Hard Knock Life. It's not Hard Knock Life, no. Okay. <laughs> I, I honestly genuinely don't know the name of the song. That's why I said don't worry about it. I think it's something like <laughs> anywhere but here. I, don't know. I okay. just know this song This song's really famous because everybody on TikTok uses it as one of those sing-along type things. And it's sung by um, Cameron Diaz. It's from the Annie remake. Actually, huh. not the original. So, yeah. Anyway. I haven't seen that one. So. <laughs> It's that song is I'm obsessed with it just because I heard it and was like, oh, this is quite good. And Cameron Diaz is a surprisingly good singer. But the movie is not worth sitting through for that, unfortunately. Anyway, all right, are we ready for number two? Yes. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Dana Andrews said prunes gave him the runes, and passing them used lots of skill. But when worlds collide, said George Powell to his bride, I'm gonna give you some terrible thrills. I really thought this was going to be easy for you guys. <laughs> I mean, again, I could guess this is Allison. Um, Allison, okay. Seven brides for seven brothers. It's not. Sorry, no. Okay. Uh, DK. Okay. Is it Hercules? It is not Hercules. No. <laughs> Prunes just make me think of Worf now. So. <laughs> do, you want me to, do, do you want me to repeat it? Or are you happy just to to pass on this? <laughs> pass for me. I, I cannot believe that, you guys. That is science fiction double feature from the Rocky Horror Picture Show. <laughs> ah, see, I'm not as well versed in that one. So. No, me neither. I haven't seen that in a, at least a decade. So, Fair enough. Uh, excuse me for this one, but I picked it because it was funny. So we'll go with number three, right? <clears throat> How is it that I can have so much straight sex while two dudes are oppressed? Not gay. For having sex? Not gay. Or putting on a wedding dress? I assume. I don't really know that much about it. Beef jerky tastes good. <laughs> I don't know, but I want to watch this now. Yeah, <laughs> I am intrigued. Uh, I'm gonna just guess. DK, go for it. Book of Mormon. It's not Book of Mormon, no. Sorry. Any other guesses? Sandy would guess it? Rent. It's not Rent. No, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, I'm There's gonna a... take that as a pass. <laughs> I'm not doing well here with you guys. Um, anyone my, sister, sorry my sister would be killing it right now. <laughs> okay, I'm going to call that one. And that is Equal Rights from Popstar Never Stop Never Stopping, which, if you haven't seen it, is brilliant and hilarious. I have, I have <laughs> never seen that. You really should. It's great. <laughs> right, number four, then. We'll hope that we get some of these. <laughs> <clears throat> I've got gadgets and gizmos aplenty. I've got who's it? Oh, Alison. Oh. Alison. <laughs> A Little Mermaid. Oh. It's the Little Mermaid. Yeah, do you know the song name? 
Um, no. <laughs> oh, it's fair been enough. Too long. Um, it, the song is part of your world. Oh, the Little Mermaid. Yes. If you'd have had a moment to sing to the chorus in your head, you would have got it, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was, that one was my favorite Disney one growing up because she had red hair like me. Yay! <laughs> I love old Disney, but yeah, fair enough. Well, at least at least you got one, so now I don't feel as bad because that's two we've got out of the four so far. So here's number five coming your way. <clears throat> got balls of steel, got an automobile for a minimum wage, got real estate, I'm buying it all up in outer space. Now that the truth is just a rule that you can bend, you crack the whip, shapeshift, and trick the past again. Hmm. <laughs> that does sound familiar to me, but I cannot. Yeah, I, I, I can hear the lyrics being sung, but I cannot for the life of you me. Are, you are going to kick yourselves when you hear it if you don't get it. <laughs> Maybe say it one more time for us. Yeah, okay. Uh, got balls of steel, got an automobile for a minimum wage, got real estate, I'm buying it all up in outer space. Now that the truth is just a rule that you can bend, you crack the whip, shape shift, and trick the past again. That crack the whip, shape shift is screaming at me, but I cannot think what it is. And mine is got balls of steel, got an automobile. Come on, what is it? Uh, I'll give you a few more seconds to try and pull it until <laughs> sing it along in your head. Pass. It's just going to be yeah. embarrassing. Fair enough. Yeah. Everyone passing here? Yeah. You sound so disappointed, Mike. What is it? <laughs> no, I, I just know at least one or two of you are going to kick yourself. That is the song Black Sheep as sung by Brie Larson in Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. Oh, Holy shit. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't seen that one, so I'm not kicking. And That's it's fair been enough. ages. Fair enough. Right, so we'll go with number six and hope for the best. Again, Alison <laughs> currently winning with two to zero to zero. <laughs> there we go. <clears throat> Here's number six. We take the pressure and we throw away. Conventionality belongs to yesterday. There is a chance that we can make it so far. We start believing now that we can be who we are. Hmm. I like that. DK? DK? Is that Greatest Showman? It's not Greatest Showman, no. Oh. Sandy or Alison, any guesses that you want to pass? No, but I have an idea now. When neither of us know it, I, then I think you should sing it and let us try to get it. Oh, from okay, there. fair enough. Yeah, <laughs> let's do that then. Fair enough. I'll do my best to sing it. And by the way, if this ends literally before the title of the song, which would have been the next line, but maybe you'll get it if I sing it along. Then so we take the pressure and we throw away convention. Now Sandy, belongs to oh, Sandy. Yeah. <laughs> it's Greece. It is Greece is the word. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> uh. so, I called that title out and I should have given you a chance to read it, to uh, give it, sorry. <laughs> Robbed you of a point there. Sandy. That's okay. It's it's what makes it hard, isn't it, when you read it with no feeling or emotion? So maybe I should do. <laughs> yeah, if we don't get it on the second, it, uh, that would be a good second round. Yeah. For half a point. Uh. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, right, number seven, then we'll try it without any emotion, first of all. I've had a few little love affairs. They didn't last very long and they've been pretty scarce. I used to think I was sensible. It makes the truth even more incomprehensible because everything is new and everything is you. And all I've learned has overturned. What can I do? That sounds familiar. It probably will be. <laughs> Are we passing to the to, to my attempt at singing this then? <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. we're just going to take it at the fact that I just love hearing your voice, man. Oh. Good Lord. I don't, so thanks for doing this to me, Sandy, but never mind. <laughs> okay, I'll put a bit of emotion into it. I've had a few little love affairs. They didn't last very long and they've been pretty scarce. I used to think I was sensible. It makes the truth even more DK. incomprehensible. DK? Mamma Mia? It's Mamma Mia. Do you know the song? I'm singing it in my head. Voulez-vous? It's not voulez-vous, sorry. Is it by ABBA? <laughs> it is by ABBA, obviously. Do either, do either of you ladies want to guess the title of the song for a point? I do not. Fair enough. No. That is um, that is Lay All Your Love On Me. <laughs> Just no recognition for <laughs> <laughs> Right. So that, and that's bringing things a bit closer. It's now two to Alison, one each to Sandy and DK. And here's number eight. <clears throat> you got some power in your corner now. Heavy ammunition in DK. your camp. DK? 
Aladdin. Absolutely, it is Aladdin. Woo-hoo. That took you no recognizing. Do you know the song title? It's uh, Friend in Me. It's Friend Like Me. Friend Sorry. Like me. Uh, so that's great. That's another point. So that brings you joint lead with uh, with Alison now. So, <clears throat> number nine. Start the car. I know a whoopee spot where the gin is cold, but the piano is hot. It's just a noisy hall okay. where there's a night. Okay. Chicago? In Chicago. Do you know the song? Uh Oh, God. I do, but I've forgotten it. Go on. Okay, I'll throw it open to the, the two ladies. Do you know the song title? Mm-mm. No. That is all that jazz. <laughs> <laughs> DK in uh, the lead. Absolutely, yeah. Three to two to one. And here is number 10. <clears throat> Have you met my good friend Maria, the craziest girl on the block? You'll know her the minute oh, you see her. Oh, Allison. Allison? Uh I know this one. Um, they're in New York, and I love this one. And uh, uh, they're like gangs. Okay, sorry, I can't think of the name. It's Can we carry on? Say- yes, please. I'll carry on. Okay. Um, she's the one who is in an advanced state of shock. She thinks she's in love. She thinks she's in Spain. She isn't in love. She's merely insane. I know this one. Ah. Uh. I know you do because you've described it. So I, I'm almost I love, tempted. This to... is one of this is one of my favorite musicals. Why? It's like I'm having a brain fart because my brain it always knows. happens when you, when you're in a quiz situation. That's what constantly happens. I'll make a guess. Natalie Wood, isn't it? Okay, I mean, Sandy, did you want to take lady. a guess? My fair, fair lady. lady no. oh, okay, only the Spain got me. Allison, you've <laughs> described so much of <laughs> this film already. I am so tempted to give you a point. Would it help if I told you that Steven Spielberg made a remake like two years ago? <laughs> no, because I haven't. Yes. I mean, I remember them doing that, but I didn't watch it. And I remember Camilla Cabello, Cabello or Cabello or whatever. She's not in it. In it. <laughs> no. I, I, I thought she was the main girl. <laughs> no, it's Rachel Zegler who's the main girl in the remake. Just She's kidding. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> I know it, but I think you should give it Alison because I don't think I'm, anyone I'm, would have got yeah. it without without that. Alison has basically given me the IMDb synopsis. It's West Side Story, but I'm going to yes. Give you the- <laughs> oh, my God. Do you, by any chance, know the title of the song? Anyone? <laughs> that I don't. Um, yeah, no. That was from I Feel Pretty. Mm. <laughs> oh. Right <laughs> after that excruciating attempt to pull the title, <laughs> we'll go with number eleven. If you want to view paradise, simply look around DJ. and view it. DK. Willy Wonka. And? The Chocolate Factory. Thank you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I need a full no. time. Have you all seen um, the previews for the new one? Yeah, I I'm can't wait. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It looks so good. Oh. <laughs> DK, do you know the title of the song, by the way? Pure Imagination. Absolutely correct. Pure Imagination. Right, DK, you're Oh, I'm not good at these. Whatever, DK. DK, you have five. Alison, you have three. And Sandy, you have one. So I know. (laughs) Matching up to do. Uh, Right, number 12. Touch me. It's so easy to leave me. All alone with the memory of my days in the sun. If you touch me, you'll understand what happiness is. Look, a new day has begun. I should say, by the way, these are all musicals that have been made into films in one way or another. <laughs> it reminds me of that song from Greece. It's not Greece, unfortunately. Uh, Sorry. Do you do you want me to sing it? You, do, you guys say love it. Please. I cannot do this justice. This is like the the song for people, but I'll try my best. Reach in, touch, Mike. Feel the emotion. Touch me. It's so easy to leave me. All um, alone with the memory. Sandy. Of my, Sandy? Cats. It is cats. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> memory. You recognized it when I sang it. So clearly I'm just a good yeah. <laughs> And yeah, you said memory. So that's the title yeah. of the song for an extra point. Oh, Lloyd Webber will be on the phone after this. Fine. You what? Lloyd Webber will be on the phone after this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to, com- to complain and sue me. <laughs> right. This is number 13. I was born in Dusseldorf, and that is why they call me Rolf. Don't be stupid. Be a smarty. DK. Producers. It is from the producers. Do you know the song title? Uh, I, I, I'm going to guess because I 
I know it's not, but it's the only one I can remember right now. Springtime for Hitler. It is springtime for Hitler, believe it. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Number 14. Mm -hmm. I remember when Rock was young. Me and Susie had so much fun. Holding hands oh, wow. and skimming stones. Oh. Had an old gold Chevy and a place of my own. I you think you know the song, but not the film, by the way. Yeah, Allison. Allison, is it School of Rock? It's not School of Rock, sorry. But I know the song. Ugh. DK, did you want to guess the song and not the movie? Because I'm getting the feeling you might have. Uh, I, it, it's gone. <laughs> oh, you were there. You had it. You said I the first know. syllable. Crocodile Rock. <laughs> Crocodile it Rock? is Crocodile Rock. Oh, can you reverse engineer what film that might be from? Uh, I can only... Take a stab in the dark. I'm just going to say Rock of Ages. No, it's from Rocket Man, the Elton John biopic. <laughs> oh, I completely forgot that film. <laughs> I think most people did, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, right, number 15. As I'm looking at these, I'm remembering half of them as I'm going as well, by the way, because I wrote this like a week and a half ago. Anyway, number 15. There's a time for everyone if they only learn that the twisting kaleidoscope moves us all in turn there's a rhyme and reason to the wild outdoors when the heart of this star-crossed voyager beats in time with yours dk dk lion king it is the lion king <laughs> do you know the song can you feel the love tonight it is can you feel the love tonight dk you are absolutely smashing this <laughs> the, ladies the, each have, <laughs> the ladies each have three points you have ten <laughs> wow uh, right, so number 16. <clears throat> this is going to be a tough one, I think. The wizard and the demon had a battle royale. The demon almost killed him with an evil kapow, but then he broke his tooth, and thus the demon said, Ow. DK. DK. <laughs> it's not Pick of Destiny, is it? It is Pick of Destiny. Dang it. I almost shouted my name. I should have. Do you know the song title, DK? I do not know the song title, so it's Sandy's chance. Okay. Um... It's so easy. <laughs> I feel guilty about asking. Oh, I was a song pick of Destiny. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it came into my head as soon as he said that. I thought, oh, Jesus. Uh, <laughs> you ready for number 17? Yes. <clears throat> Here we go. I could while away the hours conferring with the flowers, consulting with the rain, and my head I'd be a scratching while my DK. thoughts Sandy. are busy. Oh. DK, first just... <laughs> Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz is correct. Do you know the song? Uh, it's the uh, Republican anthem, If I Only Had a Brain. <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost tempted to give you an extra point for that bit of shade, but I won't. <laughs> he doesn't need it. <laughs> he really doesn't at this point, no. Right, we'll go with number 18. <clears throat> Let the stormy ch clouds chase everyone from the place. Come on with your rain. I've got a smile on my face. I'll walk down the lane with a happy refrain. Allison. Allison. Is it singing in the rain? It is singing in the rain. And I, I feel stupid and for asking, that, but do you know the song yes, title? The song is singing in the rain. It is singing in the rain. <laughs> yeah. So there we go. Allison's now on five. Sandy's on four. DK is on 13. So closer than it was. <laughs> uh, number 19. <clears throat> Lord, who made the lion and the lamb, you decreed I should be what I am. Would it spoil some vast eternal plan if I were a wealthy man? Oh. DK. Sandy? DK. Fiddler on the Roof? It is Fiddler on the Roof. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know the song, DK? <laughs> uh, if I Were a Rich Man? Absolutely correct. You are just storming away with this. The ladies both hate you now, but. <laughs> <laughs> Here's number 20. <clears throat> but I won't let them break me down to dust. I know that there's a place for us, for we are glorious. When the sharpest words want to cut me down, I'm going to send oh, you Allison. Know. I heard Alison first. Uh, the Greatest Showman. It is The Greatest Showman. Do you know the song, Alison? Break Me Down? No, it's not, one. sorry. Anyone else? DK. DK? This Is Me. It is This Is Me. <laughs> like you needed the bonus point. <laughs> 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 so, uh, let's see, what was that number... 20. Do you guys want to carry on for the next 10 or do we have time? Should I say? Yeah, yeah do it. Might as yeah. well. Fair enough. Um, number 21. <clears throat> want to save your skin, boy? You want to save your hide? You want to see tomorrow? You better step aside. 
DK. DK. It's this film, isn't it? It's a Little Trouble Forest, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know the song, though? Uh, it's Mean Green Mother, isn't it? Uh, it's Mean Green Mother from Outer Space. <laughs> that was a pretty much a gimme, but yeah, fair enough. <clears throat> Number 22. Under the surface, I feel berserk as a tightrope walker in a three-ring circus. Under the surface, was Hercules ever like, yo, I don't want to fight Cerberus? Under the surface, I'm pretty sure I'm worthless if I can't be of service. <laughs> the deathly silence is just, it's palpable every time when nobody knows one of these. Are you going to make me sing this again? <laughs> yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Fair enough. Okay. <clears throat> Under the surface, I feel berserk as a tightrope walker in a three-ring circus. Under the surface, was Hercules oh. ever like, yo, I don't want to fight Cerberus. Under the surface, I'm pretty sure I'm worthless if I can't be of service. Oh. That was terrible, by the way, but never mind. <laughs> no, it, it triggered something. It's something Disney. It is? <gasps> God, I thought it was 8 Mile or something. <laughs> no. No, but it is kind of weirdly rap related because it's recent Disney, so of course, you know, you know who it involves. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. Um it's the one with the family, the Magic Girl. <laughs> Encanto. It is Encanto, absolutely. <laughs> and and uh, again, it's the sister, the strong one, but I don't know the name of the song. Well, we're doing all right. I feel a little bit better about my choices now because we're getting some of these. <clears throat> Number twenty three. It's the terror of knowing what this world is about. Watching some good DK. friends screaming. DK. Bohemian Rhapsody? It is Bohemian Rhapsody. You know the song, don't you? Under Pressure. Yep. <laughs> Brings you to 20 points to Allison's eight and Sandy's four. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I just mute him, girls? <laughs> nah. <clears throat> right, number 24. It's not often I get things right, mate. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you, you had no confidence, and it turns out you're a musical blooming I genius. know, I think, <laughs> think he was doing some reverse psychology on us. Absolutely. He's the professional <laughs> counselor might be able to have spotted it better than I. <laughs> I'm not a <laughs> <laughs> Hustling you with musical knowledge. Anyway, <laughs> here's number 24. The sun is shining and the grass is green. Under the three feet of snow, I mean. This is a day oh, that's Allison. hard. Allison. <laughs> Frozen? Nope. Sorry. <laughs> I'll carry on. This is a day when it's hard to wear a frown. All the happy people stop to say hello. Get out of my way, even though the temperature is low. No? <laughs> Not a clue. Should I sing it for the two of you who haven't guessed yet? <laughs> yes. Okay. <clears throat> the sun is shining and the grass is green. Under the three feet of snow, I mean, this is oh. a day when it's hard to wear a frown. DK. Oh, the happy people, DK. South Park, bigger, longer, and uncut. Absolutely correct. Do you know the song? <laughs> I know it ends in town, but that's as far as I can guess. Sandy, any guesses? Mm -mm. Alison, no? Uh -uh. It's a quiet mountain town. <laughs> Number 25. <clears throat> oh, isn't this amazing? It's my favorite part because you'll see. Here's where she meets Prince Charming. Sandy. But she won't. Sandy. Uh, Beauty and the Beast. It is Beauty and the Wow, that is impressive. It is Beauty and the Beast. Do you know the song title? Um, I do. I want more. I want to be with a few. <laughs> uh, now I went back to the Little Mermaid song. Dang it. Uh. You could you could probably guess it if you want to try. Small provincial life. I don't know this. It's, it's not, but that is one of the lyrics. Would anybody like to have a guess at the song title here? No. No. The song title is Bell. <laughs> oh, I never would have. I didn't know that. I never would have got that. And what's funny is, Beauty and the Beast was my favorite because she had brown hair and liked books. So she was like me. <laughs> I thought that was so cute when Allison said that earlier. <laughs> and Aladdin was my favorite because I was poor as shit. <laughs> <laughs> and had a pet monkey. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I joke, I joke. <laughs> right, number 26. A kiss may be grand, but it won't pay the rental on your humble flat or help you at the automat. Men grow cold as girls grow old, and we all lose our charms in the end. But square cut or pear shaped, these rocks don't lose their shape. Oh, 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 um, Allison? Allison? Is it a diamond is a girl's best friend? It's time to talk to my friend. I'll give you the point for that, but do you know the film it's from? 
Um, gentlemen prefer blondes. It is absolutely wow. Well done. I like the old movies. <laughs> yeah, me too. I like. I'm a sucker for Marilyn Monroe, Audrey Hepburn, all that era. So mm -hmm. you'll get a few of these. So whenever I do this quiz, right? Number twenty-seven. <clears throat> the bigger the cushion, the sweeter the pushing. That's what I said. <laughs> the looser the waistband, the deeper the quicksand. Or so I've read. My baby fits me like a flesh tuxedo. I love to sink her with my pink torpedo. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but this sounds fun. Yeah. Um, At least, DK, there's no way you don't know this, by the way. <laughs> seriously? Yeah. I, I think we need guess. you to Sandy's I think we need you guess. to see it. Sandy, are you have a guess to see if me from singing? Is it hairspray? It's not hairspray. No. Okay. Uh, I'm going to have to sing it, aren't I? Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> the bigger the cushion, the sweeter the pushing. That's what I said. The looser oh, the waistband, Allison? the deeper. Is that Allison? Is it Crybaby? Nope. Sorry. <laughs> the deeper the quicksand, or so I have read. My baby fits me like a flesh tuxedo. I love to sink her with my pink torpedo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nothing? Nothing from anyone? Nothing, nothing. No. That is Big Bottom from This Is Spinal Tap. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that clip has to make a comeback of you singing that totally out of context. <laughs> Yes, please. I, th I think we found, you know, the little preview that goes pre-credits, mate. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. That's the one. <laughs> okay, I'll I, I'll take that under advisement. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> right, we only have three more left, I promise. So here's number 28. <clears throat> Twist it. Shake it. Shake it. Shake it. Shake it, baby. Here we go, loop-de-loo. Shake it out, baby. Here we go, loop-de-lie. You guys will all know this. This has got to be just because I was singing without any emotion <laughs> that I threw you off. Okay. Are you going to make me sing it? Because you'll get it immediately when I do. Yeah, sing it. Okay. <clears throat> Twist it. Shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it, baby. DK. Here we go. Yeah, DK. Blues Brothers. It is the Blues Brothers. Do you know the song? Shake it, tail feather. It is shake your tail for well done. <laughs> you are just not going to let anybody else win this, are you? <laughs> okay, number 29 and the penultimate one. <clears throat> there was a time when men were kind, when their voices were soft and their words inviting. There was a time when love was blind and the world was a song and the song was exciting. I'm just going to randomly guess... This is Allison. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go with Luca. It's not Luca, sorry. This was a really difficult one. I, I literally just had to Google this because I picked a part of the song that's very unfamiliar. But now I know it because I Googled my own thing that I wrote down. <laughs> uh, shall I try singing this for you again? It's another one that I won't do justice to. Yeah. <clears throat> there was a time when men were kind. When their voices were soft and their words inviting. There was a time when love was blind. And the world was a song and the song was exciting. Yeah, that's not, that's not going to happen, is it? <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to cut out all of these attempts at me singing if you don't get them. <laughs> right, that... No, no one. <laughs> no, no. That was that was a really pathetic rendition of "I Dreamed a Dream" from Les Misérables. Ah. <laughs> uh. uh. <laughs> okay, we're ready for the final one. What matters is you <laughs> try. I'm no Anne Hathaway, and that's saying something because she's come on, it's not a high bar. But anyway, <laughs> the final one. <clears throat> now, don't try to kid me, man cub. I made a deal with you. What I desire is man's red fire to make my dream come true. Oh. Sandy? Sandy? The Jungle Book? It is the Jungle Book. Do you know the song? Um, I want to be like you. Absolutely correct. So <laughs> that concludes the 30 uh, questions that I have for today. I, I'm going to tell you the scores, but I don't think anybody's going to be really surprised. By them. <laughs> In third place with a very respectable seven points is Sandy. 
Woo! <laughs> in, in second place, just a little bit higher up with 10 points, is Alison. Woo! <laughs> And storming to a lead with an absolutely insane, he needs to get a life and stop watching musicals, 23 <laughs> points. It's DK. Well done, DK. <laughs> Thank you. By and large, I avoid musicals, so that's kind of completely bemused me. <laughs> you, have, you have not been successful. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> Did we enjoy that game? Was that a bit of fun? I really did like it, yeah. yeah. It was. I have a feeling you were just about to get to the musicals I actually knew. Oh, well, maybe, <laughs> maybe if we're on a musical left. next time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I you have a chance, not... go back and, uh, sorry, go back and listen to the Chicago Review and maybe play along with that one because you might know some of those <laughs> as well. I think that's going to have to be a regular thing, Mike. Whenever we do a musical, Definitely. you're going to have to do that, if only oh, for yeah. your sake, because oh, yeah. that was worth it. That was <laughs> a good enough. idea. That's a good idea, yeah, I'm happy to do that. No and problem. you could do you could do that like with different kind of genres, you know, like Halloween mm -hmm. movies. You could do Halloween trivia kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Cool. Right, DK, over back to you then. <laughs> yeah, nice one. Uh, which is our next section, as promised. A brief look behind the scenes at today's featured movie. So, Mike, if you'll uh, feed me some appropriate music. <laughs> I couldn't find much, but this is as close to the kind of, uh, you know, vibe that we're going with, I think, as I can get. So here we go. Acoustic cinematic. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Thank you. Uh, as usual, those who know the movie and stage show intimately will probably want to tune out for the next few minutes. Those of you who are relatively unfamiliar with the behind the scenes shenanigans may find a couple of worthy tidbits in here to uh, push other more important things out of your mind just in time for when they're needed most. Uh, so with that, uh, first of all, Ellen Green, who portrayed Audrey in the original off-Broadway production. She was not originally set to reprise her role. The studio originally wanted Cindy Lauper, who told them to stuff it, basically. Uh, Barbara Streisand was also rumoured to have been offered the part, but again, uh, turned it down. Eventually, Green was once again offered the role, with Oz claiming that he couldn't imagine any other person playing the part. I can only assume that uh, these offers were by the studio themselves. Paul Dooley, who portrayed Patrick Martin in the original ending, was unavailable for reshoots. As a result, he was then played by Jim Belushi, with Dooley gaining a special credit at the movie's end. And if you watch the version with the original ending, Dooley is there with Belushi uh, gaining that special credit. Now, the movie was shot at Pinewood Studios in England, making use of every sound stage there, including the 007 stage. Part of this stage was used to film the Suddenly Seymour number. However, because of its size, the stage was impractical to heat properly and thus caused breath condensation to appear from the actor's lips. This was countered by having Ellen Green and Rick Moranis put ice cubes in their mouth during the number. Now, lyricist Howard Ashman and composer Alan Menken, who worked together on the musical and 1986 film, also collaborated on Disney's Little Mermaid. Described as an I Want song, Little Mermaid's Part of Your World was heavily influenced by Somewhere That's Green. In fact, Menken says that they used to jokingly call this one while they were working on it, Somewhere That's Wet. Now, while wardrobe and props used to create the period were obtained from thrift shops, other items were less easy to acquire, the most notable being garbage cans from the era. As a result, set decorator Tessa Davis drove around the city in a truck filled with modern garbage cans. Whenever she saw an old can outside of people's homes, she would stop and offer to trade their old can for a new one. People thought I was crazy, she later stated in an interview. Now one for Mike here. The dental tools used in Orin's office during Bill Murray's scene would be reused later in Tim Burton's Batman as the tools used on Jack Nicholson's Joker after he fell into a vat of chemicals during that movie. Ironically, Murray's role in this was played by Jack Nicholson as his movie debut in Roger Corman's original Little Shop of Horrors back in 1960. Awesome, I didn't know that. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> See, I always try and throw something in just for you, dude. Uh, technicians built six animatronic fly traps of varying sizes for Audrey 2. The smallest was four inches tall and the largest, which was used towards the climax of the movie, was over 12 feet in height and required as many as 60 human operators. Although, didn't you say, uh, he said 80, Mike? Sorry, um, during the commentary on the kind of deleted ending, he does say something like, I think it went up to 80 at one point for uh -huh. some of the more heavy sequences, but honestly, it could just be misremembering, so I wouldn't put my, much faith oh. in that. 
fair enough. Uh, the plant, however, couldn't move fast enough to sync up with the audio when it came to musical numbers and some uh, parts of dialogue. They solved this by filming the puppets at a rate of 12 to 16 frames per second, then speeding up the shot footage to the standard 24 frames per second. Whenever one of the actors sang with the creature, they had to lip sync in slow-mo for the effect to work. Remarking on this, Oz stated that it was an absolute complete bitch to accomplish. Uh, didn't you have something on that, Mike? With, uh, just a little bit, channel. yeah. It was a tiny little snippet on top of that, but it was just when um, they're sort of watching on the deleted ending, the Mean Green Mother song, uh, Frank Oz does mention that obviously it was a nightmare because they had to have Rick Moranis lip sync his parts of the song along with the plant, but he couldn't understand it because it was slowed down and it was like, as all says, it's like... So they had to actually put a harmon harmonic effect through the slowed down dialogue so that Moranis could understand it. So it was like an extra layer of complication. <laughs> Well, it, the effect work, uh, Audrey 2 is, uh, you know, as you know, a standout in the movie. And as part of the promotion, the Audrey 2 plant was even interviewed in character by the press. And on at least one occasion, the interview concluded with Audrey 2 eating the interviewer. Now, in the original edit of the Meat Shall Inherit segment, Seymour finds himself in a dream sequence described as a Dali-esque Dali -esque nightmare that involves bodily transformation, Greek columns, and a bleeding painting. The sequence ultimately landed on the cutting room floor. And it wasn't the only one, however. As we know, the original script called for Audrey and Seymour to be eaten by Audrey too, and the ending was much more downbeat. Frank Oz was reportedly devastated during test screenings. The ending cost one-fifth, about five million, of the production budget, and Oz was naturally incredibly reluctant to change it. He stated in an interview, this was, I think, the most expensive film Warner Brothers had done at the time. Now, when the movie ran its first preview in San Jose, test audiences could barely contain their enthusiasm at first. Uh, for every musical number, recalls Oz, there was applause. They loved it. It was just fantastic. Until we killed our two leads. And then the theatre became a refrigerator, an icebox. It was awful. Another screening in Los Angeles provoked a similar reaction. The ending needed a complete overhaul. As Oz told Entertainment Weekly, we had to cut that ending and make it a happy one, or at least a satisfying ending. We didn't want to, but we understood they couldn't release it with that kind of a reaction. Reluctantly, Ashman cooked up a merrier resolution. Oz claims that the difference between the success of the scene in the play and the same scene in the film is that there's no curtain call to remind the audience the actors were okay. Now, in 1998, a special edition DVD was released with that original ending. However, the DVDs were then quickly taken off sale only days later and replaced with copies with the reshot happy ending because David Geffen wanted to re-release the film in theatres with the original ending. Now, the ending was only restored 14 years, 14 years later with the, the release of the director's cut Blu-ray. And, uh, and finally, we spoke about this a few months ago, Mike. But in the grand tradition of 80s movies that aren't for kids, spawning spin-offs because kids loved it, in 1991, an animated series entitled Little Shop dropped on Fox Kids. It starred a young Seymour and a rapping prehistoric flytrap called Junior. It, uh, it lasted only 13 episodes before it was cancelled. Uh, That's unlocked yeah. a memory. That might be where I first encountered this. Uh, <laughs> you, you've, you've got to kind of feel sorry for Seymour by the time the movie rolls around, should you take <laughs> that animated series on board. But let's be honest, he kind of asked for it. I mean, to paraphrase, to discover one sentient fly trap is unlucky, to find yourself in the path of a second smacks of carelessness. I mean, <laughs> some would say the dude brought it on himself, nerd. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that's all I've got. So if you want to end the, end the music, Mike? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, cool. Yeah. So obviously we've all watched this again recently. So I've got to ask you all, what are your general thoughts this time around? I mean, we'll get onto specifics momentarily, but have your impressions changed since you first saw it? And do you think it holds up? I believe you said you, you thought it held up incredible, Sandy. It did. Uh, my first time I watched it, I watched it for Bill Moore, Murray, uh Steve Martin, Rick Moranis, wow. I watched it for them. And then this time I appreciated the music a lot more. So it did change for me. But yeah, visually held up. Nice one. What about you, Alison? Um, yeah, like I said, the first time I watched it, I didn't really appreciate it at all. Um, 
I'm a huge Motown fan, so I really liked the um, doo-wop people. And it's fun because two of them played in Martin together, um, two of the doo-wop girls. So it was cool to see them together um, doing their thing. And um, I would say, yes, that it has stood up because it's set in what, like the 1950s and really... You know, a lot of things that were made in the 80s when they would try to do the 50s, you could still see the 80s in it. But um, besides maybe her blue eyeshadow, you know, um, Audrey, Audrey, um, most of it was pretty on point. And they sometimes wore blue eyeshadow in the 50s. So. <laughs> um, was, that a, was that a dig at Happy Days, Allison? The 80s or 70s trying to be the 50s? <laughs> Actually, no, I love the Happy Days. And I don't think I really realized... Um, that when I watched that show growing up, you know, um, yeah. and one of my favorites is Laverne and Shirley, but no, I think that means more so like movies, you know, when movies mm. would do the, do that in the eighties, like their Greece hair did that would, as well. Didn't it? Greece was the seventies yeah. pretending to be the fifties. Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, like their hair would be teased. Like, like you could still <laughs> tell they had their eighties perms going on, but they were trying to do nineteen <laughs> fifties hair yeah. or they'd have those bright eyeshadows that, were so indicative of the eighties, but in the lipsticks and stuff, but I thought this one did a good job of portraying, um, you know, that time frame. Now, one thing I did have a problem with, but I know that's the time frame that they're this, you know, portraying is the treatment of women and Steve mm. Martin's character, yeah. uh, which I get is why they fed him to Audrey too. Uh, <laughs> he was, he was just pretty horrible. And, um, and also, I didn't really like how Audrey won, the OG Audrey, um, felt like she had to have a man to um, do anything in life. But again, I know that was sign of the times. So, yeah. 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 And how about you, Mike? Um, it's weird. I, I, I don't want to give the impression that I'm like suddenly, yeah, this, this is the greatest thing ever. But I did prefer this on this watch to any of the other times I watched it. And I could appreciate a lot of the things more that I was kind of put off by other parts of the movie. You know what I mean? Like other things distracted me from liking things that I know now are kind of good. And as I said to you, Afe, there are still parts of the movie that I really like. Um, I would go so far, as I said to you, as to say that I love the musical. I'm not fond of the seven SNL sketches that they jab in there. But um, <laughs> you know, that's just my personal opinion and nobody probably shares it. But no, I love a lot of the stuff here. Some of the songs are fantastic. And I like the kind of the overall story. Like you, as we were discussing off air, I prefer the theatrical ending. And so I don't want to acknowledge the director's cut as being a kind of a thing, because for me, that kind of ruins the film even more. And yeah. it would probably lower my score even further if we take that ending, because it just, to me, doesn't work at all. Well, Although, I know it, you watched you watched kind of both versions. Can yeah, I just, yeah, yeah. I, I don't mean to interrupt, but can I just throw out to uh, to you, Sandy, and you, Alison, which version was it that you watched? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, the one that I watched ended with um, them panning in on a little tiny Audrey, too. And yeah, it that's the theatrical yeah. ending. That's yeah. the theatrical one. <laughs> okay. Same. Same. Nice. And that's the one you do prefer, Mike? Or? Yeah, because, like I said, the... They try something with the director's cut and it works for kind of the Roger Corman original and I guess it works on stage because, I don't know, maybe you can just get away with it there and it's not quite so tonally jarring, but as DK said, without wanting to, you know, spoiler alert or whatever, uh, it's just a weird choice that the movie kills off both leads. It kills off Audrey, then Seymour, mm -hmm. and then has like a 10 minute scene of plants rampaging and destruction that you sit through just shell shocked, like, what? What, yeah. what am I supposed to be feeling here? <laughs> yeah, I mean... I I guess it, you know, I, I guess it does fit in tonally with the the stage show, but to me, it just doesn't work yeah. in the film. And as you say, they've got ten minutes of it, and by the time the ten minutes are over, you just you kind of feeling really depressed. I think the way it ended is, you know, most people want the happy ending; they want the two characters mm. together, but it also leaves you with, hmm, like yeah, there could be more, you know. Yeah, there's some ambiguity there, and I love that, but. I, at the risk, you know, I'm going to mention it later. We're probably going to be all called heretics because everyone else seems to prefer the uh, the original, right. and I, I just, I just don't get that. Maybe. But I'm, are those people? I'm sorry. Um, are those people the ones that that's what they saw first? Because I feel like you tend to like what you 
what you first were introduced to. Right. Yeah, I, I do think a lot of people have, that prefer the original have come into this from the stage play and they've kind of, mm -hmm. you know, seen it more than once. I think also that, I mean, it almost won me over with just how dang impressive the model shots are. And like I said to you, DK, if they'd found a way to incorporate as like a nightmare that Timo had or something, it would be like, because it's criminal that they lost it. Because even though, like I said, it's 10 minutes of plant destruction, which after what's happened, you're kind of like numb to. But watching it just as its own thing is like a weird kind of 80s Godzilla movie with Venus flytraps. It's kind of, yeah. it's epic. It's really good. Like, I'll put some pictures up when I edit this in, but, like, we are talking giant plants rampaging through cities, destroying trains and buildings and busting through walls. And this goes on, like I said, for 10 minutes. It costs, like, $5 million, as DK it's, was saying. And it's like, yeah, it's ob obvious that they, they put a lot of budget into that because it looks stunning. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's just, it doesn't feel right to me. I mean, it's not feel right to me. I, I, I know uh, there's a lot of people out there saying... You know, there's a, a few songs. There's a song you never know that was rewritten into some for now. The, I think there's yeah. a, like three or four songs that's from the stage play that's just been completely, completely cut out of the the movie whatsoever. Yeah, I should have said as well when it came to the director's cut ending that they, I kind of get what they're going with with the reprise of somewhere that's green to give it a whole new meaning when she's like, make you just you've got to feed me to the plant because that'll be my somewhere that's green and we'll be together forever and whatever. But I'm like, that kind of ruins the song at the same time. <laughs> it's like, dang, that's dark. <laughs> it is. It, it, the songs that have come before, and yeah, they're kind of, they, I don't know how you guys feel, but it's kind of, an, these songs are earworms to me. But when it plays them in the context that that darker ending, it just kicks the hell out of you emotionally. Seeing that, mind, Ellen Green gives a fantastic performance of her dying. <laughs> it's it's epic. It's really well acted. Because so. you guys mentioned the, the plugs of the skits from Saturday Night Live. Um, I mean, obviously, I noticed all the different plugs of people um, in there, but I'm not as familiar with those skits from that time. I was just so, being facetious. It's just the way that, like I said, uh, a, a, lot of the, a lot of the time when people come in for me, it just feels jarring. It seems like... We're stopping the movie here so that we can have Steve Martin and Bill Murray do a bit for 10 minutes. And it's like, yeah, it's funny, but right. it's just got no place in this movie. You know? I had assumed, though, that it was just scenes from the from the actual Broadway, off-Broadway musical. Like, the, the, each character's introduction, that's how they would do it in the musical. I don't think okay. so, but I don't know for sure. But it seems, it I strikes don't me. Well, it's things to me of like let's improv and do something funny, and then they just well, kind of kept it in. Well, what the was Bill section was that? improv, but the, but yeah. it was uh, the character was in the original. As I said, it were yeah. Jack Nicholson in the original Corman one. I'm not sure if that character is in the stage play. Uh, yeah, well, nowhere near the other side of that. <laughs> Sorry. I was gonna say the only one that was weird to me was um, Bill Murray's character. That was just, I mean, clip. It, it's like. Is it Oren? Is that how you say his name? Oren? Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, he clearly found his match in someone who was sadistic and liked pain. Um, but that just was like, what was the point of that whole thing? I felt like all the other ones, you know, you could find, you know, they plugged in somehow, like the guy at the end, um, Belushi, you know, with the wanting to. Yeah, him. yeah. I'm, I'm not so much But that was that, just but... like, what? what is this? Like him getting off on pain and then. I don't know, like that one was just kind of weird to me, but I'm, a lot of people love that though. <laughs> yeah, it's that particular one where the you know Bill Murray's trying to out kink Steve Martin and Steve Martin's just not having it. It's it's a very odd thing. It's a, it's it's a, yeah. It goes on a little too long for me because that I think if it would have been like maybe a minute or two shorter, you know, yeah. like why did you you could tell he was he had a kink from the beginning. So <laughs> like it's why just, did you keep I don't know. For, for me, it just seems like a lot of the time it, the film's overindulgent. And that's the biggest problem is that it's like, without wanting to sound overly offensive, I can't think of a better word, but it's just basically self-congratulatory, like how funny they all are. And it's it kind of like, yeah, all right, but can we do a story here? You know what I mean? Like yeah. right from right from the first part when Christopher Guest comes in, which again is funny as the first customer, but he's giving a performance that is in no way remotely realistic at all. And it's yeah. just, again... There's tongue in cheek, and then there's tongue so far up your ass that you can taste brown. You know what I mean? It's, it's just all right. Calm down. It is difficult <laughs> though to take something on the on the stage and bring it to 
TV or, or film and having your vision, either it's totally throwing away the fact that it was a play like Hairspray did, or yeah. um, celebrating the fact that it was, you know, some of the aspects of theater and putting them in the movie, such as Audrey's exaggerated makeup and the way they're all front facing all the time and how the sets themselves are almost like staged set pieces, something you, you know, you would see in the, in the musical. Um, yeah. And so I think kind of that is, is jarring and that's either rubbing you the right way or the wrong way. In addition to, you know, whether or not you grew up with these actors and love them and, and appreciate their style of humor. Cause this, you know, Frank Oz worked with Steve Martin and a bunch of other things. And, and um, what I'm saying is I, I get it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I, I understand. I think overall, it's what makes the movie, you know, like the over the topness is, is just what makes it. That's a cult yeah. classic element, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, th I mean, I think Oz, you know, as I say, curtailed the more egregious aspects of it to try and help with the pacing. But I think you were telling me offline, mate, uh, Mike, you're still having a, a bit of a problem with the pacing as far as this thing went? Yeah, it's just, I think I mentioned it in my conclusion, so I don't want to like, you know, spoil that. But basically, it's just relentless and it's exhausting because it just seems like, I mean, for starters, there's like 20 songs in this 90 minute movie. It's just, there's far too many. And it just seems like you're, you're either jumping from song to song or you're going from song to unrealistic comedy sketch to song. And it's just like, there's a movie in here that's desperately wanting to get out and it's being suffocated by all this excess baggage for me, which is kind of like, Oh, and which isn't to say that it's all bad. Like I said, there are parts of this that are fantastic. Like I genuinely am moved to tears by Somewhere That's Green uh, when Ellen Green sings that. That's a fantastic use of that song. Suddenly Seymour is a great song. Mean Green Mother from Outer Space is my favorite song in this. So these songs for me totally work, but it's just like if I was directing this movie, whether you have the purists of the stage musical or not, I would have cut at least 50% of the songs that are featured in this because honestly, if you want to name how many are memorable, there's maybe six out of the 20 that I used. So, right. you know. I mean, I, I guess it's, at, you know, down to how familiar you are with the the product itself. I mean, yeah. we, I, I came to it pretty much straight away. And as you say, there's there are standouts. Mm. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, looking at it, when we, you know, with the writing of it, with regards to you know, excising certain bits and putting in his own, you know, kind of thing. I mean, what did you think to the writing with regards to, to the, the 90 minutes that we got? I'll go, I'll go straight to you, Mike. Uh, well, not to, not to repeat what Alison said, but I have a major issue with the, the kind of the treatment of women as well. Um, it's, it just, it's very uncomfortable and it's, it sort of, it feeds into my other problem with this film, which is kind of something Sandy was alluding to, which is that I think for me, I hate Steve Martin in this. It's, gross miscasting and i get the feeling that it was frank oz over correcting because it's like we don't want that to be so offensive and so kind of un unbearable for the audience that we're going to try to make it so ridiculously over the top funny but then that just comes off as offensive in a different way because it's like there's nothing funny about this yeah. dude beating up a woman you know what i mean and, and instead of it being you know convincing but he gets his comeuppance. I just, I'm never convinced that Steve Martin is threatening for a start because he's just ridiculous. He's giving, you know, I've, I've seen subtler performances in a Mighty Morphin Power Rangers villain <laughs> than he gives in this movie, you know. But uh, yeah. Plus, as I say, when you, I, I, I haven't seen it recently, but I have seen the Roger Corman original, and that character in particular is a lot more, I mean, not fully, but a lot more grounded and a lot more kind of sinister and threatening. And I kind of much prefer the way that he dies almost by accident in that original story. It's not like as. It's not like the plant going, he deserves to die for being a bad bastard, doesn't he? <laughs> you know, so, and he doesn't really even have that relationship with Audrey, so you, you avoid all that kind of domestic abuse nastiness as well. So, yeah, it just kind of feels like these these are weird choices for the movie to make. Nice. And what about you, Alison? What, do you have any notes on the uh, on the writing of it? Um, I mean, besides kind of what I already said, I don't know. I feel like it, it kind of... I don't know. I mean, it flowed. I mean, it went with, I don't really know the original um, stuff, so I can't compare it to that. And um, I didn't so much pay attention to any specifics, except that 
you know, some things just like Steve Martin, for instance, that was very, um, didn't really buy it. And, but it was also like, why are we making this so over the top with this? Like, she comes in with a bruise and then, um, I don't know, like calling him doctor. I don't know. Like some of it was just over, over, over the top. I don't know if that makes sense. Like, yeah, it's, it's almost kind of like Mike was alluding to that. They make it into such a joke. It's kind of undermining the point that they were trying to get across in the first place, which is kind of even more offensive than just going the domestic abuse angle. Yeah. Something like that could have been more subtle. Um, I mean, she comes in with a, a bruise, you know there's something going on. And especially for that time period, it wouldn't have been talked about. You yeah. know, it, it wouldn't have been that overt um, as it I was. Say, sorry sorry to, uh, to interrupt. There's a line as well that really rubs me up the wrong way, which is played for laughs. And it's just so dark and not cool, which is when, like, they, they've killed the dentist guy and... Uh, Seymour's saying to Audrey, like, are you sad about this or whatever? She's like, no, it's it's actually a great thing. If nothing else, I'll save so much money on Epsom salts and bandages. I'm yeah. Like, That's not funny. <laughs> yeah. 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 What about you, Sandy? Have you got anything? Yeah, I mean, I, I speaking to that part specifically, I guess I just saw the whole thing differently. Like, they did try to soften the subject, I guess, while they were vilifying him. Uh, you know, by having that domestic abuse behind, it was just a shadow, you know, of it that we saw, shadows of it. You know, we saw the black guy, but we never actually um, saw it viscerally. You do, you do see him brutally slap her when she when they're going into the house after she falls off the motorcycle. It's a shadow, though. You, you yeah, like the, So, I mean, they, they were trying to um, kind of vilify him without taking the subject so seriously because you're right. It would have been offensive if they tried to take it seriously. And at the same time, he's, you know, a caricature, but I guess for me pulling back and looking at the writing, uh, that didn't bother me. I didn't think about it because I, I just saw all of this as a Broadway play. And so everything was supposed to be, you know, over the top. And, um, so I didn't see it in that aspect of it being offensive because he wasn't, you know, really a true villain, but, but I mean, it wouldn't have fit it would then it wouldn't have fit in with the whole thing. The, um, the, yeah. Then like kind of the vibe of the, the whole piece as it were. Yeah. But the, but the problem I did have with the writing is kind of something like what Mike said is a, um, s many of the songs you could do without, you know, my eyes kind of glaze over in it and maybe they, that time could have been better spent. Um, getting Seymour to this crazy place where he where he had to be, you know, towards the end that that Seymour was making him do so many awful things. Well, we only saw like two awful things, yeah. you know, that that happened, and maybe that time would have been better spent kind of building up that aspect. But otherwise, um, yeah, I thought I would, it was I would, enjoyable. Um, I would say the same thing about the fact that like he's his meteoric rise to fame is like a thirty second montage, right? And it's like well. <laughs> We're supposed to, I mean, I get from context what you're trying to say, but could we have not cut a couple of songs and given that a bit of room to breathe, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that too. <laughs> what what got got to me is, uh, I mean, you'll, um, you'll probably have noticed it, Mike. It seems to take some kind of left turn into satire and a satire on consumerism in that original ending as well. Oh, yeah, very. Especially when it, they're all piling in to buy their Audrey 2 plants. <laughs> and it just seems to come completely out of left field. Yeah, you've got a kind of an element of satire that runs throughout the, the, the piece on a whole. But it just seems to become this this whole new movie kind of, it's, you know, it's war of the world because with... Yeah, the film starts pro-consumerism, though, because, like I said, Christopher Guest's over-the-top performance is just basically, well, I'll just have to buy twice as much. And they're like, oh, wow, amazing, yay. And it's kind of like, you, to go from that to, you fools, wasting your money on frivolous things, you'll kill yourselves. It's just like, I had what? read also that it was meant to uh, kind of uh, be a satire of, of how far will people are willing to go to get what they want. Like, you know, hmm. he wanted that life with Audrey or he wanted Audrey to be safe. And and how far would she go to get that ideal life that she saw in a magazine? I mean, it's it's the same with uh, with Mushnik 
later on where he's saying, well, if you just, you know, I pay for a one-way ticket out of here, if you just tell me, if Seymour would have just at that point told him what were going on, that could have solved well, it. Yeah. So you, kind of does, I suppose that does feed into the kind of, although you were saying at Jars, it does feed into the consumerism thing because the idea there is Mushnik is blinded by greed when he's like, you can get out of here and avoid jail, but tell me how to keep the plant going because it's raking in the money, you know? So, yeah. yeah. And yeah. at that point, you, you see Audrey too as almost this kind of devil on people's shoulders, even if they're not necessarily aware that the character mm. is there. And I, I very much saw that with Seymour. I, th I think to me, I wrote down that there's a kind of Dracula Renfield relationship almost going on, which I wish they'd done more with, with Seymour and Audrey. Yeah. Sorry. With regards, I mean, we've already had your feelings on, uh, on Steve Martin. Did you have any notes with regards to other performers in this? Uh I'll let the ladies go first. I'm talking too much again. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll go to you, Sandy, this time first. Um, say the question once more. Uh, any, you know, the performers with regards to this? Mike's obviously, he's made his feelings known with regards to, to Steve Martin, but you say you, you kind of get this a little more because you grew up with these these comedians. So what are your feelings? And is there any standouts in this, in this cast for you? Um, I did feel, though, that Steve Martin's, portrayal was a bit cringy at times that that is true that, and that's why i mentioned much earlier that he was probably the worst thing about um the whole movie a standout performances i just really do like uh rick moranis and ellen green is it yeah um because i appreciate her portrayal because um that was so close to being annoying but the lisp was just dialed back just enough and her voice squeakiness was dialed back just enough and her sweetness you know kind of i just feel like i don't know if that was just her coming out the person or if she was just really that good to walk that line and to have found that that sweet spot and then for rick moranis uh just really thinking his earnestness and in, in his uh portrayal of Seymour uh, was pretty good. And so I I did like most of that. Um, Bill Murray was fun, but but all of these other characters, John Candy was um, probably my second least favorite of, of the whole thing, but it's just because he plays an annoying character on purpose. So he captured that perfectly. Um, and I, I just, um, that's how I pretty much felt about those. No worries. And what about you, Allison? Well, like I said, I really liked the doo -wop girls. Um, I grew up watching Martin. So as soon as I saw them, I was like, oh, my God, it's Gina. And um, I can't remember the other one name, other one's name. But, um, you know, I didn't even know who the third lady was. I don't recognize her. But the two were in Martin together. Um, and I like I liked well, until they kind of overdid it. But I liked how they opened it with them singing. And it was kind of almost like a narration. Um with that kind of do op Motown feel. Um, so that they were probably my favorite um, characters. Um, you know, I mean, it was kind of cool to see the different faces, but I wasn't really getting it because I, you know, I mean, that was a little before my SNL time. I was more yeah. like Sherry O'Terry, Will Ferrell time. Um, so, I mean, I knew that they were, big comedians, but I didn't really, I don't know, get it. And then, like I said, it was a little over the top for me, but um, my other favorite would be, and I'm sorry, I can't remember his name. Was it Levi? The guy that nice. wore cops? Levi Stubbs, who voices oh, the too. Yeah, um, like I was saying before we started, um, I really, I thought he did a really good job because a lot of times people who are musicians don't, um, you can tell they're musicians and not actors, but I thought he did a really good job portraying Audrey. Um, nice one. And what about the leads? What about Rick Moranis and Alan Green? Did you have any feelings on those? Um, yeah, I like Rick. I liked um, Rick Moranis because really I remember him from Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. So <laughs> yeah. that was, you know, probably the first time I saw him as a child growing up in those movies. So, um, you know, it was kind of cool to see, you know, him and other stuff before those movies came out. So I liked his, um, his character. And I also liked seeing how he went from this kind of 
shy, wimpy, nerdy young guy to having more, um, I guess, gumption, so to speak. Um, and if Audrey, too, brought that out of him, you know, that's a positive. But um, kind of learning to stand up for himself. Uh, the other character, Audrey, she annoyed me just because women like that annoy me. <laughs> that's just my own thing. Um, I don't, you know, that's, um, and her voice annoyed me, but I know that's how she was supposed to portray it. But at her, she was probably one of my least favorite characters. That's, to be that's, fair. that's fair enough. Uh, I've just looked up his, uh, Tina Arnold, Michelle Weeks, and Tisha Campbell as the, uh, as the Greek chorus, the narrators. Yeah, what about you, Mike? Uh, yeah, this is where I'm kind of, um, apart from the people that I've already kind of crapped on, unfortunately, sorry. Um, I love the performances in, in regards to the leads. I think Moranis, Ellen Green and Levi Stubbs are all fantastic and all brilliantly cast. Like, I'm, I'm kind of somewhere between Alison and Sandy when it comes to the character of Audrey One, because like I said, I, I don't really buy the whole idea of staying with this abusive guy and the idea that it's just because, well, got to have a man, which is kind of crap. And um yeah, pining for this nerdy guy. For starters, that's unrealistic because believe me, the nerds never get the girls. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, apart from that, I mean, like I said, her performance when she actually turns it on, particularly her singing voice and especially in like somewhere that's green, like I said, is, is so gorgeous and so beautifully done that I can kind of almost forgive the rest of it. And uh, yeah, Moranis just plays luckless schlub because he plays that in every film from like Ghostbusters to Spaceballs or whatever. But why not? He's good at it, so it's hard to complain, you know. Have you never seen Streets of Fire, mate? I haven't, no, sorry. He's the villain in that, alongside uh, Willem Dafoe. I mean, technically he's the villain in Spaceballs, but he's still a luckless schlub. <laughs> 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 but yeah, and uh, yeah, um, yeah, Levi Stubbs, as we said off air, I, I think is just genius casting because it's one of those performances where you can't imagine anybody else can do it justice because it required such a fine touch of like that deep more towny type voice to deliver all those songs, that sense of kind of menace, but also coolness undercutting it. Otherwise it just becomes like, if you hated the plant without that kind of level of like, oh yeah, smooth, <laughs> then you'd be like, huh, this is just uncomfortable, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Um, so I think it has to have that bit of air as well. And other than that, I think Vincent Gardenia, yeah, stereotypical kind of angry boss, but it's a good role from a good you know, character actor. Um, I know he was good in, was it Moonstruck? Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people. Yeah, like... Cosmo. <laughs> Cosmo, yeah. <laughs> so he, he was good at what he was. And um, I didn't, as I say, I didn't like any of the kind of like, oh, just bring out the director's roller decks. So I didn't particularly like Bill Murray. Although it was funny, it just was out of place. Didn't care for his appearance or Christopher Guest or Jim Belushi. But, and <laughs> this is where I'm probably going to be hypocritical. I really loved John Candy, but that's probably just because it's John Candy. Yeah. And like, like we've said in the past, DK, any any scene or movie or appearance by John Candy, I'm going to automatically love anyway. So uh, John know. Candy automatically gives a star for me. I don't care yeah. what it is. <laughs> it's yeah. funny you mentioning Vincent Gardinia. I mean, he had a, a, a apparently a substantially reduced role from the character in the the stage show. Uh, in the stage show, he supposedly sings a couple of songs, and you wouldn't really know it in this. This is one of the elements where they did cut something out because they thought it would be better just as a bit of a conversation. Uh, from but from what I can understand, Vincent Gardiner himself only took the role if it would involve no singing. <laughs> that's a sensible man, right there. <laughs> that's, that's, that's kind of a ballsy move to sign on to a musical and say, I'm only going to do it if I don't have to sing. Oh, and um, yeah, I will say it as well with regards to the cast. Yes, I did spot a young Danny John Jules on a couple of occasions from Red yeah, Dwarf, which was like, whoa! <laughs> and a younger Miriam Margolis. I did not see her. Wow, okay. She was the uh, dentist assistant that he kept smacking oh, with the dog. Yes, wow, oh, wow. She was yeah. so different. Okay, wow. Right. Yeah. Oh. So... With bearing in mind, with regards to what you mentioned earlier with Levi Stubbs, we'll get to the you know the big thing about this, the FX, especially you know, and most of it obviously concerns Audrey too. What are your feelings with regards to uh, the effects in this? I'll start with you, uh, Alison. You know, I actually so I know a lot of this time frame, a lot of 
effects and the Muppets and all were done by Jim Henson. Do we know who they were done by? In this it wasn't movie? all Jim Henson. I think Frank Oz did bits and pieces as well. He does say on the commentary that oh, he was okay. kind of a... He says he was known as a puppeteer, but he doesn't actually do any of the puppeteering in this film, weirdly enough, because he's directing it. But, yeah. I forget oh, okay. his name, but there was um, someone who designed the Muppets who also worked with them on Sesame Street. I forgot okay. his name, though. Um, well, I, you know, I actually really liked the... Um, animatronics or whatever you want to call it. Um, I think they did a really good job, especially for that, you know, back, I mean, 1985-ish, probably when they were started filming or whatever. Um, you know, um, I think, and then I remember, remember when Audrey 2's head falls and it's like super heavy. So yeah, yeah I can imagine it being like 80 something people needed for, for that. Um, but yeah, I mean, down from the little one down up to the really big one, um, I, I think it was pretty good. And I do think it, like you were saying, Sandy, it does hold up to now. I mean, how, I mean, unless they use CGI or something, how would you? That would ruin it, I think. Yeah. I think so too. That's what makes it, I mean, how it looks and how they did it is what makes it Audrey. DK was, said exactly the same thing to yeah, me. Yeah, I was on saying a, to Mike like, earlier before we came on air that you you could literally get this film out now and use it as an advert for why practical effects often are better than CGI. Because I think this mm -hmm. is just, Audrey 2 is just flawless in this. It's so good. I, I even messaged as I was watching the film, I sent like a screenshot of Audrey 2 to DK and just said, I freaking love these animatronics. It's just yes. amazing. <laughs> I, yeah, I feel like out of, you know, I mean, there were a lot of, movies in the 80s that used animatronics um i'm thinking of like labyrinth and at one of if my you say the dark crystal that was also co-directed by frank Oz. Okay. Yeah. um i haven't seen that one but i was thinking you of should. my t my tv shows like i love fraggle rock that was my jam <laughs> but, um, so but yeah i mean there was a lot of kind of muppet animatronic stuff going on then and i think um this holds up just as well. You know, I don't think it looks muppety though, because there's a chance. I mean, the, the muppets no, have definitely. a kind of. It does a little of later when the when the smaller plants join in on me yeah. being muppet. Yeah, yeah. yeah but that's it, during it, a song, so you kind of have to accept the kind of uh, a, a bit of an unreality to that particular thing, you know. This one might be more like Gremlin level, you know, mm. like whatever they did to make the Gremlins. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah. it's got to have been a pain in the neck, like you said, from the sheer number of people to... Uh, Frank Oz does say on the commentary that the plant, the main plant, weighed a literal ton, not an exaggerated, like an actual ton. So it was, like, impossible to to really do much with it, get it moving or anything, and, yeah, it was a, a bitch to work with. But I will say as well on the subject of the, the Muppets thing, I did mention this to DK off air as well. Um, if you go to the deleted scenes and bloopers for the film... There's a lot of like different scenes of um, you can hear Frank Oz directing in the background, and I don't know if this is intentional or like just his the way that his mind works. But he lapses so far into like Muppet voice that I'm watching these deleted scenes and I'm going like Fuzzy Bear, what's what <laughs> going on? <laughs> like just uh, yeah, just just get the gate to your camera, camera two, scene one, <laughs> Waka Waka. <laughs> I uh. I know it's only a small part. I, I love the whole section in Somewhere That's Green, the the kind of surreal aspect of it when in that oh, like, little sequence with the, the house and the white picket fence. And even I've shown the, you that, um, that family guy clip that copies it yeah. literally exactly yeah. because it's, it's just so, so iconic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, even down to the little animated bird that comes in all Snow White, I, 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 I love, oh, love yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. That was the one thing I was like, okay, too far. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like that. There's another thing I like about the, the theatrical ending, the fact that it returns to that. So it's kind of a nice little payoff at the end. But you've still got that ambiguity. And I, I, I just don't think that kind of works when you, you know, when you get rid of that. Because it allows you to, you know, develop your own headcanon as to what happens next. Because it's got that, as I say, it has that ambiguity with the, you know, the, the tiny little other Audrey too that you know has that little smirk at the end and I like how that's done it's not so in your face as the original ending this probably that, that was actually my favorite part that I yeah. listed you asked about our favorite um that besides the obvious like mean green mother you know I mean that's just awesome um you know for like a subtle favorite part that was it just that yeah. very end spanning in on the little Audrey too with that little like 
<laughs> smirk like you think you won, but you didn't. That yeah. I loved that. I thought that was just great. I'm, sh I'm sure there's like tons and tons of little shop of horror fans turned off in disgust at the fact that none of us really care for that original ending. But I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to to you, Sandy. What did you think to the effects with regards to uh, to the movie? That's mostly what I meant about it really standing up. I thought it was um, really the intricacy of how the mouth moved when he was singing. I they I read that it was you know steel cables over you know under the uh, the facade and. I don't know. I'm just like, it, it wasn't at all jerky. It was very smooth. But beyond that, how they brought the plant to life with his vine arms, um, like that one moment, speaking of like the devil on your shoulder, when uh, Rick Moranis is walking through right after he's had his uh, night with Audrey and he opens the one door for him to walk in and then he opens the next door for him to pass through. Yeah. Um, like like Rick Moranis just isn't even noticing, you know, how how much he's like weaved his vines into his life, basically. And then later when he's um, tricking Audrey, he calls her on the phone and the way that the vines, <laughs> you know, they they moved. They went to the cash register. They pulled out a coin. They went over to the phone. They put the coin in. They dialed the number. And then how, you know, he's holding the phone to his ear while he's twisting his hand in the telephone cord, you know, like you see in the movies back then when they had the yeah. phones. And then, you know, twiddling his fingers on the wall, waiting for the answer. And just all the, how they just really brought it, him to life in that way. And, and all those fine movements. I loved a little bit impressive. where he actually checks for checks change. The change, yeah. <laughs> I just thought that was so impressive. Yeah, yeah. Go on. What were your thoughts on the on the direction on Oz's direction throughout this? I I thought there were some really good moments. I think it's you can see his style kind of pops. And um, at first, I did think that he was hired because of the kind of Muppet thing, and I was shocked to learn he wasn't doing any of the like animatronics puppeteering side of things. But I think it probably is. It probably does speak to the fact that as a director, he knows what's expected of the people doing that, if you know what I mean, so he can empathise with them in a way that a director who doesn't have that background might not. Um, having said that, I do also love the touches that he brings just because he his sensibilities are quite over the top, and even though I don't love some of the like comedy sketches and stuff, I do love like the jump cuts or the Dutch angles when people are entering the shop or little things like um, during the scene at the dentist's office when he's actually showing the camera is inside a patient's mouth like, yeah. uh, or looking out. And I was like, this is the kind of cool, like, stylized type thing that I like to see from a director as opposed to just lock the camera between two people talking or whatever. So, and even the things that are like, like I said, things that I don't love overall that work in the moment, like pulling out the drawer of dental tools and they kind of shine in that comical cartoony way. Like, ah! <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I can't really think of anything else other than to say, let's see, what did I have? I love the gloriously cheesy intro, the fact that it's like that text type thing. I was put off at first by the kind of chorus of the three girls because I didn't like the unreality of it. But then I realized what he was going for was the whole Greek chorus aspect. So I'd probably have to watch that again with that in mind. And yeah. maybe I'm being a bit unfair. Uh, I love the two leads kind of coming together on the street corner when they're singing at the start, but not knowing. Yeah. So they're kind of either side of each other. Um, and I did think there was a, a very weird, obvious matte painting of like a background train <laughs> during one of the scenes, which put me a little bit off, but that's again, me just being nitpicky. Okay, what about you, Sandy? I really um, did like the direction and how it was acted almost blocky. Um, you know, the way they were blocked in, in each scene. Um, probably my favorite scene of the entire thing um, that I think was really well directed is when he's going back and talking about how he first came across Audrey too. And he's doing that walk with the arms swinging and yeah. then um, that stylized part of the movie, which uh, if I'm not mistaken, would have influenced um, things he did later in Stepford Wives and something he wasn't involved in, but down with love, how just really every movement of that scene was tightly uh, choreographed. I, I loved that part. Awesome. 
And uh, you, Alison, anything stand out with regards to uh, sort of the directing? Um, no, usually, I don't know, I'm one of those people, please don't hate me people, but I don't really pay much attention to the director stuff. Um, unless it's just something that really stands out, like um, they do something completely different with um, effects or uh, not effects, but you know, like if it's in some kind of sepia tone or, you know, sepia, whatever. Um, I don't normally uh, notice that kind of stuff. I'm sorry. No, no, that's fair enough. We, we all, you know, we all bring our own experiences to this and we all get something different from it. Uh, two things that stood out for me i like that I'm, I'm not keen on the the scene where uh mushnik's going up the stairs with seymour and that song i think that's one of the songs that could have done without that it's supper time but i do like the how the greek chorus is portrayed in that they're almost in silhouette faceless as if they're kind of taking audrey's side i love how that was done and I love, you mentioned the opening scroll, Mike, I think it was. Uh, I love how you're looking at it and you think it's in outer space and all of a sudden the bottle hits it and you realise it's a puddle on the street. Yeah, and little touches like that are really cool, I think, yeah. Transition. Yeah, I really like that. I think, it, I think. I mean, when I first, you know, hear Frank Oz, I don't, I, I don't associate him as a director because obviously he's working in other things, but uh, I think he was really competent in this. And, you know, the odd pacing issue aside, I think he, uh, he did a, a bang-up job. Yeah, it's hard to argue with that, really. I think, as I said, even though I don't love a lot of the decisions, I think the direction is definitely more than competent. So, yeah, definitely. Okay. I mean, we've covered the music with re regards to the songs, but the songs that were there, do you, does, does anyone have any particular favourites or, you know, any comments on Mencken and Ashbourne in general? I mentioned Vine, so I'm going to let the ladies go and be quiet. <laughs> I mean, I think definitely Feed Me Seymour is uh, one of the better ones. And then Little Shop of Horrors, that song I really like, except for the chorus, because the chorus has been you, over, you know, you hear that hook line often whenever it's advertised. Um, so the rest of that song is more enjoyable to me. And then... Um, Yes, somewhere that's green, also a, a very good one. Uh, what's the song? Um, I think it is a part of Feed Me Seymour, where um, right when he's um, talking about, you know, they're gonna go ahead and feed the dentist to the plant. Yeah. What song is that? That I believe that is the uh, that's the same song. The okay, yeah, it's just a really long song. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I did um, like. I, I did like just just into sorry. I did like the the whole when he sees Audrey uh, getting slapped by Orin. I did like how the neon red from the uh, the plant shot reflects on his face, as if to uh, you know signify oh, that he's neat. getting angry. I didn't notice that. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Go on, Alison. Oh, that's okay. I um I do like that introductory song i don't remember what it's called i don't i just remember i liked how it set the tone i think it's just called skid, skid row, row. <laughs> yeah okay no no the, fir the first one's just little shop of horrors it's uh, downtown is the skid row one okay the one where it's kind of like they jump around like in the shadows and then they're on the roof and i don't know i feel like it just kind of sets the mood for what you're going to expect in the movie and um and then I, I like Suddenly Seymour. I feel like that's just, you know, right. when, you, when you hear that one, you just, you're like, oh, yeah, that's that's from that movie. Uh, you know, like you just know, I don't know. And then especially when um, they start singing it together, um, you really get to hear her voice, which is quite surprising coming out of her. Um, and then also, you know, Mean Green Mother, I like. I like that. Like that. Um, is that what it's called? Mean Green Mother? I, I think believe so. so yeah. Okay. Yeah. Those are my top two choices. Yeah. I think I'm going to go with the title. And I, I as much as I love Somewhere That's Green, uh, the Skid Row downtown beats it for me. I love that one. It gives me a lump in my throat every time. Not sure why. 
Uh, apropos of nothing but since we're on the subject of discussing a movie with Ellen Green in, if you haven't seen the TV show Pushing Daisies, it's fantastic oh, and you should. Beautiful show. <laughs> yeah. And she's a, one of the main cast in that. Her and Susie Kurtz are the two kind of kooky ants in that show, yeah. and they're just so good. <laughs> Never has a show made me want pie more. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly, yeah. Such a good show. Should never have been cancelled. Two seasons of just pure brilliance. Yeah, and it was it was an optimistic show as well, which I liked, and you don't really get that yeah, a lot. Despite being a show that's ultimately about death, it was surprisingly yeah. optimistic. <laughs> oh, so, with regards to uh, to the movie, is there anyone else, uh, anything else, any of you thinks that we've missed, anything that we haven't covered? Um, just um, one uh, favourite line from one of the songs uh, regarding when Seymour decides he's going to feed the dentist to Audrey. I love when he says, um, the guy sure looks like plant food to me. Yeah. <laughs> nice one. What about you, Alison? Anything else you think we, we've not done or have you pretty much reached the end of your notes? Um, no, I, I did make note of a favorite line. So it kind of, I'll have to, my favorite line is at the end of this little sequence between Oren and Seymour. Um, it's when Seymour comes into the office to to get him to take him, you know, for food. Look, Seymour, this could happen to you. Unless I take immediate action. What's that? Real. It's rusty. It's an antique. They don't make them like this anymore. It's dirty, heavy. Dull. I'm gonna want some gas for this. Thank God. I thought you weren't gonna use any. Oh, the gas isn't for you, Seymour. It's for me. You see, I wanna really enjoy that fact. I'm gonna use my special gas man. <laughs> and the way he's throwing Seymour around, because Steve Martin's a big guy and Rick Moranis is a small guy and he's literally tossing him around in those scenes it's so funny yeah i think yeah. the editing of that's brilliant when he says well get in here and he like lifts him up and then it immediately cuts to him slamming him down in the chair <laughs> yeah that i just i don't know i liked that whole even though his character was problematic that whole scene was just funny it was yeah. a good one what about you mike anything that uh, you don't think we've not discussed a couple of things that I wanted to bring up. First of all, in the director's cut ending, when the, um, I forget the name of the actor who's in it, who gets cut from that, but when he basically is giving them the idea of, I've created a little uh, uh, offshoot of Audley True and we oh, yeah. sell them around the world. And Paul he basically Dooley. says, that, Paul Dooley, that's right. He says to Seymour as he's kind of running away, like, no, don't do this. He shouts to Seymour, uh, we don't have to do this with you. You know, vegetables are public domain. And I'm like, that's got to be a reference to the Roger Corman film. The fact that he didn't copyright it, so it is public domain. You can watch it, like, anywhere. Like, you can yeah. go on the Wikipedia page and watch the entire movie because <laughs> Corman just didn't want to bother. Like, he thought it was just our trash. Don't bother paying to get it in copyright or anything, which I think is amusing. Um, I forget what else. I did have something else. but I, I guess he's kicking himself for that one. Jesus. Yeah, man, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I probably did have something, but I, I can't really remember what it was, so it couldn't have been that important. Oh, no, that was it. Sorry. It was just another little random bit of trivia that um, Mean Greed Mother from Outer Space was nominated for a Best Original Song Oscar, and it was the first Best Original Song nominee to contain swearing. Because, like, tough titty, you ain't got shit, I say up yours, etc. <laughs> yeah, they had to alter the lyrics for the live performance. Yeah, exactly. I was going to ask, because I couldn't see that. I couldn't see that on stage. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, is that it then, then Mike? Yeah, we can just do favourite character moment line conclusion. Yeah, and we'll, we'll move right along to that. So, uh, yeah, it's favourite character line and scene. Uh, we've we've had your favourite line, Alison, so we'll go to you, Sandy. What's your... Uh, well, your... I did do that. Yeah, I'm sorry. I thought when you said anything else, I thought that was the end. But, yeah, my, my favourite line was the, the guy sure looks like plant food to me. And, oh, yeah. and favourite moment was lining up right along with that because... Um, like Allison said, his his arc, how he become how he starts out as this shy guy, and then later on, um, you know, a bit more assertive and kind of going after what he wants. And right there, he sure looks like plant food to me. Is the moment like all of a sudden he becomes angry when he's singing and determined, and I just like that part right there. Nice one. What about you, Mike? What's your uh, what's your favorite line, buddy? My favorite line is also from part of a song, and it is. You know, I don't come from no black moon. I'm from past the stars and beyond the moon. Yeah. You can keep the thing. Hey. Keep the it. Keep the creep. 
Sweet Jermaine, don't mean shit. You I don't know why. Just read my entire favorite line. Oh, no way. <laughs> Seriously. Seriously. Well, there you go. She has to be looking for a second clip when I come to edit the sound clips in there. <laughs> yeah, nice one. And uh, what's your favorite scene? My favorite scene? Yeah. Um, is I've already said it, it's the original, uh, the, the Mean Green Mother kind of ending, but only on the theatrical cut, because that song just doesn't work when you've just killed Audrey, it kind of ruins it, unfortunately. So yeah, in the original cut, it's that moment, like the way it gets all exciting and cool, and the plant starts doing its fantastic singing and attacking him and everything, I don't know why, I just like, yeah, cool. There we go. Well, you give us your Sunday, so what's your favourite scene or moment in the movie, Alison? Um... My favorite scene? Oh, yeah. it's the one where at the end where they zone in to the little Audrey too. Yes. Because it leaves oh. you wondering, you know, like you were saying earlier, like you can kind of come to your own conclusions. Do they yeah. really get there happily ever after? Is this plant going to have like world do domination? You know, um, it just, and it has this little smirk on its face. It just, was, <laughs> it just made me laugh. Yeah. Uh, it, I think I'm, for favorite scene wise, I think I'm gonna have to go with that that entire Skid Row number. I just love it. Yeah. So I can see why you would say that. Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. And uh, with regards to favorite character, uh, yeah, we'll come back to you, Alison. Do you have a favorite character in this? Oh, um, side characters would be the um, duop ladies, and then um, main character would be Seymour. Nice. What about you, Sandy? Yeah, Seymour is my favorite. <laughs> okay, Mike? Audrey 1 was close, but like I said, there's just too much problematic kind of, uh, unfortunately, baggage with that. Um, and yeah, as I was thinking it through, I'm like, I hope this doesn't say a lot about me as a person, but my favorite character was the plant. <laughs> because, like I said, there's a cool kind of smoothness there. And again, it doesn't, that, that's not the case when you get to the director's cut and the plant's actually like really brutal and, you know, kills a lot more people. But like in the, theatrical cut of the movie he kills a total of two people and they're not very nice people anyway and like i said there's just something about that performance and the animatronic that just gives it such character along with levi stubbs's vocal performance that's just like i kind of I, I know it's evil but i kind of want to be friends with this part, well know? and he did say i mean he gained nothing by putting audrey and uh seymour together he really did want what was you know him to have a good life yeah. What a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> he just wanted world domination, too. <laughs> I, <forget> to who. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to I'm going to have to cheat a little and go with the Greek chorus for my favorite characters. Well, Alison, they the deserve same. they deserve yeah. someone making them their favorite. Yeah, I, th I think they were, you know, absolutely fantastic. So, yeah. So, yeah, as usual. We'll give our uh, final scores in the moment, but before that, we'll head into what you guys out there think with the audience participation center, uh, center, Jesus, uh, section. Uh, we asked you all what you thought of the movie, and on this one, you didn't disappoint. Normally, we've got to send out a few prompts to encourage people, but uh, apparently you were ready and willing to give your opinions on this one. So I'm going to once again pass you over to Mike, who's going to see what you had to say. Mike? Yeah, absolutely. Um, apologies, by the way. I was feeling really ill earlier today when I was trying to to collate all this so if i've missed anyone out i do apologize but i have quite a bit most of this comes from our various kind of facebook groups and other social medias uh first of all david howland just says you'll be a dentist now spit um andy johnson says still one of my favorite films and i normally hate musicals uh, rick everson who you'll know from our star trek podcast if you're a listener says i've only watched this for the first time in recent years i know what do i do with my misspent youth and i absolutely loved it the whole thing is just so much fun rick moranis is incredible in this the poor hapless seymour who's just swept up in the most bizarre series of events steve martin is terrifying as the dentist okay and the songs are awesome and memorable also loved spotting a young danny john jewel singing in the flashback i also love the darker alternate or original ending it's a great fun crazy movie with excellent songs and utterly enjoyable thank you rick uh, mike lord came in with quite a long one says it's a funny film and moranis is perfectly cast as seymour but as someone who had the original off-broadway cast album and knew every song off by heart i was upset how many songs they missed out where is mushnik and son it's just a gas and worst of all they changed the ending although i understand the original has been restored as an alternate version on the blu-ray i'm sorry but i just can't love this movie because too much of what made the stage version magical has been omitted i think it suffers from being made at a time when hollywood wasn't really doing musicals and perhaps 
perhaps had forgotten how. So instead of getting a big screen version of the stage show, we have a Rick Moranis comedy with songs. And it's proof that studios should never, ever listen to test audiences. One day we will hopefully get a remake that more faithfully adapts the source material. But until then, I'll stick with Roger Corman's original. That might be a contender for the hot take award this week. Yeah, I think, I think that's the one. Yeah. Um, my cousin, Maddie O'Neill, uh, chimed in with, uh, this is the best. The three girl singers are outstanding and Steve Martin is brilliant. Actually, everyone in this movie plays their parts perfectly. Uh, Damien Woods says, I love this movie ever since I saw it as a kid. Steve Martin as the dentist kills me every time. Uh, Sean Northage just says, love, love, love it. Deborah Shield has a little gif of... Uh, Parks and Recreation, just saying I love it, of um, the lead character from that, Leslie Knope. Uh Caroline Harrison says, brilliant movie. The choice of the voice of the plant was inspired. I like the alternate ending too. Athena Williams has a gift with like and then love, and love is ticked. Simon Wolford Mullen says, absolutely incredible, deeply entertaining. Ellen Green is sublime. Steve Martin is superb, and Audrey 2 is perfect. Rachel Sophia just says, great movie. Rune Vaughan, who you will have heard on our last episode, says, this is a top favourite show for me, and the film is Chef's Kiss. And yes, they did literally say Chef's Kiss. <laughs> Um, Adele Z Heatley says, love it, watch it at least once a year. Simon Wolford Mullen says, it is without question Steve Martin's finest hour. Better than Parenthood, better than Father of the Bride, better than Only Murders in the Building. My intro to it was the movie. I came to the stage version later and I'm less enthused about the ending being changed for the movie, but that's Hollywood for you. Also, Ellen Green is exquisite. And finally, uh, well, sorry, second from finally, Jamie from our Discord, GA Productions says, I've never actually seen the film. I've only seen the original stage version years ago. I've been meaning to watch the film for a while though and i just wanted to end with one thing if i can find it because dk said it to me earlier and it's actually from a letterbox review but i just thought it was too amusing not to include here this is from holly beth on uh, letterbox who gives the film five stars and says that was fucking wild i can't believe i just watched steve martin fuck bill murray on a dentist's chair five stars <laughs> yeah that's the audience response for uh, for the little shopper for us i do like that we've got some uh, conflicting views on that one that, uh, yeah. you know, it, it just goes to show the values, you know, of our own experience as far as these things go. Uh, yeah. So if you missed out on letting us know your own thoughts before this recording and you want to answer anyone here, please let us know either by leaving a comment here or on our social media. And to those that did take part, once again, thank you for getting involved. So, uh, yeah, we now know what you out there think which means all that's left is for the creatures here to give you the final thoughts on our special well, feature. Uh, you heard me, boy. Uh, so this time, uh, Sandy, we'll start with you. You've got anything to sum up your feelings on Little Shop of Horrors, and what would you give it out of five? I do. I, um, Besides just this movie being something that I wanted to watch because I loved all the characters in it and, and pretty much anything that any of them were in, um, I thought that it was really fun and well directed and choreographed again just really impressed by its special effects but to really sum up my own thoughts i was going to cheat a little bit and read a little bit of roger ebert's contemporary review of this so this was from december of 86. the wonders of little shop of horrors are accomplished with an offhand casual charm the movie doesn't labor its jokes or insist on its virtuoso special effects but devotes its energies to seeming unforced and delightful. Um, the quiet romantic moments are allowed to have their coy innocence. And this, what I thought was really cool, he said, this is the kind of movie that cults are made of. And after Little Shop finishes its first run, I wouldn't be at all surprised to see it develop into a successor to the Rocky Horror Picture Show as one of those movies that fans will want to include in their lives. N nice. He, he hit the nail on the head. Brilliant. So what would you give it out of five? Uh, so out of five, I would give it, I'm sorry with the points, but five is so small. I would give it a 4.4. 4. A 4.4. 4. Okay. And what about you, Alison? Wow. That was good. I should have thought of looking something up and reading it. <laughs> um, I, I'm really glad that you asked me to do this because it was so fun to rewatch it, um, have a different perspective as an adult versus as a teenager. I really enjoy it. Uh, I think it's a great movie. Actually, I think this one would be a fun one to have as a live showing like they do um, Rocky Horror. It might be a little hard with a Audrey too. Maybe it have to be a lot smaller or something, but um, like a costume. But I think that would actually be really fun. 
And um, I would give this a four out of five. Okay, nice. And over to you. Well, do you want to go first, Mike, or do you want me to go first or what? No, I'll go first because I probably we should, uh, in a similar way to Flash Gordon, we should probably end on a positive with you. So. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so, so it the, begins. So it begins indeed. So, no, sorry, I, I tried to keep this short, but my conclusion as I was writing it just ballooned. So I'm sorry, it's going to seem vaguely like I'm reading an essay. But anyway, <laughs> I just said a film that is aggressively and unashamedly over the top, for better or worse. For me, it works some of the time, but overall, it's more to the film's detriment. Many a film will employ a heightened reality, and it can make an audience feel in on something if they respond to it. But for me, this film just has such a veneer of fakeness that it prevents me from believing almost anything or making a meaningful connection. It's like somebody invited their improv group to do a play. Sure, sometimes it's very funny, but so is a comedy sketch, and that doesn't tread on a narrative. It's also just exhausting, never stopping to breathe. It doesn't feel like you can get a handle on anything, and with no fewer than 20 songs, 15 without reprises, crammed into 95 minutes, you could you feel like at least two or three could and should have been cut in favour of more acting and characterization. There's only about half a dozen memorable songs anyway, if you ask me, though I will say that those are excellent, from the tear-inducing Somewhere That's Green to the climactic riot of Mean Green Mother. There are some really great performances here and stellar casting, but the one or two miscastings, in my opinion, really stand out. It's frustrating because I want to like this movie. I'm actively trying to connect with it, and then I'll have to grit my teeth, no pun intended, through a bad SNL sketch to get back to the plot and the greatness of Moranis Green and Stubbs. <clears throat> Excuse me. All that said, I can definitely see the appeal here. Oz was the perfect fit to direct for a number of reasons, and his style does pop. The practical effects are fantastic, and there are a good few rightfully iconic moments. I enjoy this more after seeing it a few times and knowing to brace myself for the things I dislike, but I still can't ignore those things. I know this is definitely more fresh than rotten. It's closer than it should be. And I went with 3.5 Audrey 2s out of 5. <laughs> Fair enough. Right. Uh, well, I'll give you mine then. I've put... Uh... This is a weird one for me. Uh, when I was very young, I was terrified of plants, and it's a hang-up that's kind of stayed with me. So I've got a love-hate relationship with this. Every time I watch it, I get goosebumps. Some of the songs are beautiful, and it becomes stuck in my head for weeks at a time. Technically, it's amazing. Practical effects are still miles ahead of most CGI work done today, and is, in my opinion, one of the best stage adaptations out there, regardless of the changes from the live show. But like that test audience, for some reason, that original ending on the movie leaves me cold. I can't explain it. And I know many out there are probably calling me out for heresy. But as beautifully done as that ending is, the nihilism together with my personal hang-ups prevent this thing from being outright perfect for me. Call me sappy, but I do prefer the theatrical ending. Yes, it's happy, but it's also ambiguous. And I like that. However, I also recognise that it's not the ending as intended, so it makes me disappointed in myself for not liking it. Regardless, my own psychological issues aside, it's still a fun and enjoyable movie and deserves its reputation as a classic, and I'm going to give it 4.5. So that gives Little Shop of Horrors a combined score of 4.1 Audrey's out of 5. Absolutely, 4.1 Audrey 2 out of 5. Nice. Yeah, so are you guys happy with that? Yeah. Yeah, it's a little higher than I would have went personally, obviously. But, uh, <laughs> but thank you for that. Oh, thank you for having me. I would love to come back. This has been fun. Oh, you enjoyed to have it? you back on again, yeah. <laughs> sorry, Is have you right? enjoyed it, Alison? <laughs> oh, sorry. Yes, it's been fun. I, I enjoyed doing this. Yes, thank you. Nice one. Well, I'm, as Mike says, I'm sure we'll uh, we'll have you back at some point if you're willing. Yeah, it's been lovely meeting you. I don't know how GK came into uh, contact with you, but it's been fantastic talking to you for this one. So that's been good. Twitter, Twitter, Trekkie. Yeah, Twitter. <laughs> fellow Trekkie on Twitter. So yeah. uh, while you're here, Alison, is there anything you'd like to plug? Have you got a social media you'd like to make anyone aware of or any coming projects you'd like to promote? Yeah, sure. Um, so I am actually working on an ebook, and it's my first venture into that side of things. I am creating a guided journal. Um, like prompts, you know, um, for anyone who's probably done like an intro psych class, you might be familiar with Maslow, Abraham Maslow, Hierarchy of Needs. So the book is based on that, um, helping you identify whether your needs are met or unmet to help you grow and prosper. The name is going to be called um, Among the Wildflowers, Recognizing Your Needs for Growth. 
uh, don't really have a set date just because I'm self-publishing. I can do it when I want to do it. But um, I created a, like a professional social media on Instagram and it is U Y O U dot R A R E dot among dot wildflowers. Fantastic. I'll, uh, we'll make sure we put that link in the description below. And so hopefully yeah, we'll get you a few more, uh, a few more people coming along. Thank you. How have you found today's show? You enjoyed it? Yes, I did enjoy it very much. I'm still nowhere to find me though. Oh, so you've got <laughs> nothing that you, uh, you want to promote or anything like that? No, just Mike's discord. <laughs> uh, okay. And last, so then last but not least, usual thank you to my partner in crime, Mike. You're very welcome, Seymour. I don't even know what I was doing there. It's It's been two hours. I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> well, the listeners know they can contact you via your link tree below, but anything else you're yeah. looking for while you're here? No, I always tend to leave the link in, as I say, to um, we're trying to save the Tyneside Cinema local to me because we're, you know, it needs to raise some money to stay open. So you can always find the Love Tyneside Cinema link to check that out and donate if you see fit. Uh, and please do, because I've seen so many great films there. And again, you can find my multiple, multiple social medias all just in, under Linktree because I can't be bothered to type out all of them because there's so dang many now. So <laughs> the Linktree is in the description. Just go through that if you want to find me on Instagram or Blue Sky or Tusky or Twitter x or z or tumbling or whatever i don't know <laughs> nice well, well you know as usual post all links in the description so if you guys out there are inclined hit them up get in touch and that includes our coffee link as usual any contributions you can make that help us keep the show running we're more than incredibly grateful and it keeps mike off the streets <laughs> so uh, next Down up skid row. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, it looks like everything's coming up Wilson. Not only did we recently discuss his favourite cult movie, and if you haven't checked that out yet, please do, but next week we're returning to our normal service on the Silver Screen podcast. It'll be two weeks, by the way, not next week. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, Mike's persuaded me to dip my toe into another of his obsessions as we take a look at 2017's Power Rangers movie. Yeah. <laughs> now, it's uh, the 30th anniversary of Power Rangers. I had to do something. <laughs> this, fair enough. I am actually looking forward to that one. Fair enough. So, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I think we might have Connor on board to review it with us as well, fingers crossed. Uh, oh, nice one. Uh, <laughs> as for cult classics, that will return in a few weeks' time as we're joined on our little movie tourist bus as it takes a detour into San Francisco's Chinatown. And what we're doing there, well, we'll leave you to guess on that one. Until then, if you enjoyed today's show, then please let us know. Also, like, subscribe, and share. Please help spread the word. And we'll hopefully see you next time. Uh, I am now off to do some terrible things, but not to you, audience. Never to you. You have been listening to the Silver Screen Podcast, hosted by Michael Wilson and DK. Created, produced, and edited by Michael Wilson. Behind the scenes sections and additional material produced by DK. Music by Timeless Journey. More information can be found at soundcloud.com forward slash timeless journey. Follow the podcast on Instagram at Silver Screen Podcast or look for the Silver Screen Podcast under Facebook groups. Links to all our social media accounts and more are in this episode's description. This podcast is available on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Just look for Silver Screen. Hit or miss Star Trek. This has been a Mike's Podcast Production. Copyright 2022. Thank you for listening.